Good evening. I call to order a meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, April 9th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by the avid scholars from Hollabird STEM. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, of liberty and justice for all. Thank you, that was wonderful. The next item is item C, consideration of the April 9, 2019 agenda. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to, to tonight's agenda? Yes, Madam Chair and members of the board, I'm requesting to remove the following items from tonight's agenda. Item FY 2019 Capital Budget Supplement, Item S, Watershed Public School Incorporated, Item T, Water Testing, and Item U, Board Committee Updates. Is there a motion to approve? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Offerman, thank you. Uh, may I sh see a show of hands? Any opposed? Thank you. The motion carries 11 to 1, Ms. Gover. I would also like to make a motion to affirm the addition of the item for the external audit. Which is agenda item N. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Can I see a show of hands all in favor? Thank you. The vote is unanimous, Ms. Gover. So the agenda stands as amended and approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. <coughs> to discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item is selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who signed up will be permitted to speak. Our first speaker is Ms. Helen Valiant. Our second speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our third speaker is Mr. Joshua Marks. Fourth is Mr. Muhammad Jamil. 
fifth is, I believe this is Ross Kahn. Sixth is Ms. Lori Phelps. Seventh is Ms. Brenda Pfeiffer. Eighth is Ms. Betty Fields. Um, she signed up twice. So another one. Ninth is Ms. Erica Franklin. Tenth is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Thank you. Our next item is public item. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupt or interfere with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call on our advisory groups to speak. Our first speaker for this evening is Ms. Abby Baton, president of TABCO. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Han, Ms. White, and members of the board. Uh, I did think that the watershed information was coming up tonight, and that is what my remarks are on, and I figure I'm going to say them anyway. So uh, you will be receiving a report from the Watershed Charter School uh, slated to open next school year in our county. Charter schools may serve a purpose when rolled out properly. They are meant to be laboratories to test new and innovative ideas for, sc and, uh, for schools which, if successful, could be incorporated into our regular curriculum. This experimental function requires innovation. To serve that role, charter schools must bring new ideas and curriculum to our children. TAPCO has met with the folks from the Watershed Charter School Administration on more than one occasion and have grave concerns about their program. While the incomplete facility is likely to be problematic, what is even more concerning is the lack of curriculum across the board. All we have seen is a short overview of the theme for each quarter and a long list of the standards to go with each theme. Otherwise, aside from approximately a week of material for the second grade, there is no curriculum. Nothing new or innovative, just plain nothing. What is even more concerning is that the first time we met, we found no assessments in the material, and the second time, the assessments all look the same without any specifics. When we pointed out this lack of curriculum, the watershed staff even told us they would use B BCPS curriculum while they took the time to complete their curriculum. How is that innovative? How would that be serving as a lab for educational ideas? It is not, and it begs the question, what is the point of this charter school at this moment in time in our county? We should not spend money on a charter school if it is going to look the same as our comprehensive public schools. Our master agreement is in place not only to protect teacher rights, but to make sure our teachers have the tools they need to do their best work for the children in Baltimore County. Without decent curriculum in place, this simply can't happen. Rushing to put something out there does not address the underlying issues. Simply put, for the Watershed Charter School to open this coming year, it is a travesty. We say we want to put children first, but we, then we ignore the problems staring us in the face. If this charter school moves forward and opens next year, our, st our st students, excuse me, our students and our faculty will be hurt by it. So I hope that you can do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Megan Stewart-Sicking. Good, e good evening. Good evening. 
Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Ms. White, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. Tonight, I want to speak about two contracts. Since April is Autism Awareness Month, both happen to benefit students with autism. On your agenda tonight is a contract for services from BCBAs. Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA, is based on the science of learning and behavior. ABA can be used to reduce behaviors that may interfere with learning or may be harmful. But it's not just about what it reduces. ABA is also used to increase language and communication skills, to develop self-care skills and routines, or to improve social skills and academics. ABA is an evidence-based best practice treatment, according to the US Surgeon General and the American Psychological Association. It's taken a while, but in the last couple of years, we have now hired six BCBAs for our own staff within BCPS. CCAC has strongly advocated for these positions and for continued increases in BCBAs. But autism and developmental delay are the fastest growing populations within special education in BCPS. And the number of BCBAs we have is not nearly enough for the needs we have or the increases we anticipate. This means we have a critical need for these contractual services. We highly recommend that the board not only approve this contract, but also continue to work with us to increase and develop the use of BCBAs in our system. The second contract I want to address will appear in May for comprehension materials, specifically in this case, visualizing and verbalizing. Often you hear from us about critical resources for teaching our students to read, but we have to acknowledge that beyond just the words, there are many readers who struggle mightily with comprehension. We know that for some students, words go in one ear and out the other, and they have no idea what the text means. Research tells us that students with strong reading comprehension are constantly seeing a movie in their mind of what's going on. If they lack this ability, they are said to have a weak concept imagery. For some of us, building rich images as we read is natural. For students with autism or other disabilities that affect language and communication, this has to be taught. We need to teach students to develop concept imagery so they can understand meaning when they are reading. Visualizing and verbalizing has been shown to improve comprehension, memory, critical thinking, vocabulary, and general cognitive ability. Visualizing and verbalizing is a significant addition as we build a set of resources we want in the hands of our educators. Please remember the name visualizing and verbalizing and pass the upcoming contract for these critical comprehension materials. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. It's been a little while since I've had a chance to get here and speak in front of you all, so I'd like to share some of what we've been um, busy with. In February, we had a listening post meeting at Stimmers Run Middle School, where Principal Brian Thanner was very welcoming to our group and where we were thrilled to have BOE member Rod McMillian also in attendance. The goal of our listening post is to hear from stakeholders about what they are experiencing with advanced academics and GT and where they find strengths and weaknesses. We host one every year and try to move them around the county so that we hear from a diverse group of stakeholders. In March, we had our monthly meeting at Sparks Elementary and had a chance to continue work on some communication pieces we are developing for BCPS parents. We know parents are looking for resources that help them understand how advanced academics works in BCPS and their written parent-friendly language. And just last week, we had our April meeting at Milford Mill Academy, where we were warmly hosted by student board of ed member Alima Adekoya and the Milford Mill Academy administration, headed by Principal Kyria Joseph. At this meeting, the presenters were the three community superintendents, Christina Byers, Dr. Raquel Jones, and George Roberts. This was a well-attended meeting where we were once again happy to see Mr. McMillian and also to have Charles Young, a representative from County Executive Johnny Olszewski's office in attendance. This meeting was really informative and the audience was deeply engaged. We were super thrilled to have in our audience um, students as this is a stakeholder group whose voice we would want, we want to be louder in our advocacy work. Our hope is to have future annual meetings at the student BOE members' home school so that we can hear what is on students' minds. 
At each of our meetings and even in between them, we hear from parents. What have we been hearing lately? Concern about the potential changes in language course offerings at middle school and how that might impact students who hope to get to AP level five or six or attain the bilingual seal of literacy. Concern about how to navigate early entrance into kindergarten for a four-year-old. Concerned about how to get students who are in the Math Acceleration Head and Shoulders program appropriate time with a teacher. Concerned about the inability to find data on the BCPS website about how well BCPS is serving GT learners and to find schools that will be the right fit. And as always, constant concern and comments about the lack of communication about advanced academics in BCPS. Parents who don't know their child was accessing advanced academics in elementary school. Parents who don't know there are GT facilitators in every building. Parents who don't know that there is supposed to be a universal screening for every third and fifth grade child in the district or what the result of the screening was. And parents who don't know that their own school is hosting a meeting related to GT. And they don't know about us. We hear at just about every meeting from parents, boy, I wish I had known about this group earlier. So if you're a parent or a student or maybe uh, who maybe hasn't heard of our group but wants to know more, then please join us for our May meeting with Dr. Russ Brown with BCPS's Division of Research, Accountability, and Assessment. The meeting will be here at Greenwood on Wednesday, May 8th at 7 p.m. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mr. Tom DeHart from CASE. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Well, we're in the midst of our superintendent search. And please notice that I said our, not the board or the search. I say this because this search process belongs to all stakeholders, not just the board. As Vice Chair Hen said in her Facebook post yesterday, and I do follow you, when discussing the superintendent search, she said, process matters. So let's lay out that process. First, thank you to this board for providing multiple opportunities for stakeholders to share our desires for the next superintendent with Ray and Associates. I attended three of the sessions, including the case session where, by the way, Superintendent White was given resounding support as the permanent superintendent. The search process following that stakeholder input was explained to us by Ray. Stakeholders' input in the sessions and online was used to create a flyer with the desired characteristics to be shared with candidates who inquire to who Ray reaches out or may already be in Ray's database. Ray will then call those applicants for this board who will then work to further refine that list based on questions they design. Responses will be completed in an anonymous fashion and based on the responses, the list will be whittled down to the finalists. The board will then interview them in person and choose the superintendent and announce it to the public. But there's something missing in this process. Our community will not know who any of the candidates are until we are told who the board has chosen. CASE realizes the need for anonymity early in the process in order to attract candidates who otherwise may not apply as they are probably already employed and don't want to jeopardize their current position. However, CASE emphatically recommends that when the board chooses their two to three finalists, that they are publicized and each are brought into our district for a day to meet the public, staff, and stakeholders as neighboring districts, and in fact districts across the country have done. Since this board's leadership espouses transparency and has stated that process matters, we should expect no less. And one last thought about process and the board. CASE encourages each member to continue to be an independent thinker and make decisions based on your knowledge and your beliefs. That is all we can expect and we trust that you will. Thank you for your dedication and your thoughtful deliberation during this process that is so important to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Kyria Joseph from the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators. Good evening. 
Uh, good evening, Board Chair Kathleen Causey, Board Vice Chair Julie Hinn, Superintendent Verlita White, and Board members. Again, my name is Kiria Joseph, the President of Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, fondly known as PCAFSI. In March, PCAFSI had the opportunity to provide our input to Ray and Associates Incorporated for the superintendent search. We believe a superintendent should have the following characteristics and beliefs, committed to closing the achievement and opportunity gaps for children of color, which benefits all children, has the respect of all individuals, values diversity, and vigorously addresses equity issues, and will continue to expand the equity work, even if it is in contrast to what the board wants has the ability to develop, maintain, and engage parents, business community, and the school district in the educational process as the direct link on student success, has had previous experience in leading a large school district, committed to an evidence of success with dealing with all genders, races, socioeconomic for students and staff, committed to both enrichment and academic programs committed to safety for all and who has experience with climate work to improve schools. The willingness to preserve and understands the Baltimore County precepts and beliefs honors transparency and provides multiple ways to engage with all stakeholders to collaborate on solutions to bring BCPS from good to great. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi once said, truth never damages a cause that is just. The truth is BCPS has 63% students of color. This is over 71,000 students. BCPS students represent 115 countries and 97 languages. But CAPSI believes the board must be willingly willing to explicitly and intentionally address the issues of race as it relates to the treatment of employees and students' inequities. But CAPSI would like to request to be a stakeholder group to meet and dialogue with the two to three finalists from the superintendent search. Pacapsi believes that the process does matter. Please be reminded, the purpose of Pacapsi is to create and provide a network of communication for educators, particularly educators of color in Baltimore County. It is to enhance the skills and capabilities of educators for improving the quality of education for all children and students, particularly ch children and students of color, to provide a forum for disseminating information on trends and issues concerning the education of children of color, and to facilitate the resolution of commonly perceived problems. Pacapsi hopes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Amy Freeman. The, um, Chair for the Central Area Education Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening, board members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. <laughs> um, I continue to hear from families about persistent transportation issues, buses late to pick kids up, late to bring them home, not showing up at all, lack of communication with families regarding what is being done to address these issues. I realize that there is a shortage of drivers, but we should be doing everything that we can to, reta to retain the drivers and attendants that we have, as well as recruiting new ones, a problem compounded by the fact that the pay BCPS offers for these positions is among the lowest in the state. Given these facts, it is extremely troubling to see on tonight's agenda a request to transfer nearly $4 million out of the transportation budget. With all due respect, it makes absolutely no sense to me and many other BCPS stakeholders to decrease the transportation budget at this time. Also, another topic I wanted to talk about which was removed was the lead testing, but um, I, I'm gonna comment on it anyway. Oh. <laughs> the testing for lead in drinking water that has been done to date is based on legislation that was passed in 2017 to set the elevated lead level threshold at 20 parts per billion, 20. However, in the 2019 legislative session, which ended yesterday, new legislation, House Bill 1253, was passed that redefines an elevated level of lead to be a lead concentration in drinking water that exceeds five parts per billion. 
According to the legislation, this change applies retroactively to any regulation adopted pursuant to the drinking water outlet testing and recommendation program. Regardless of whether the test was conducted before or after the bill's effective date. That means that all of these reports that have been done this year will need to be revised to incorporate the new cutoff of five parts per billion. I respectfully ask that the information about the change in the state's definition of elevated lead levels in drinking water be posted on the BCPS website where the lead test results are being posted, as well as provide a proposed timeline as to when the revised test results using the new threshold will be made available. Thank you. Thank you. And our uh, next speaker is Mr. Ray Mosley from the NAACP. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Ms. Penn, um, Ms. Valida White, I have to see where everyone is, and the other school board members. My name is Ray Mosley, and I'm president of the Randallstown branch of the NAACP. I'm here tonight to express the strong support for Ms. Valida White as permanent superintendent of BCPS. Our support is not based on Ms. White being African American, but rather it is based on the fact that she is highly qualified and has demonstrated her strong commitment to a student first philosophy in her decision and making process. Ms. White has consistently demonstrated that she has the leadership skills, the management skills, and the experience required to lead the diverse BCPS system, which consists of the 114,000 students that we refer to, and the fact, as Ms. Joseph pointed out, that it's 63% students of color. Ms. White has consistently promoted positive student behavior, which is conducive to a healthy and safe learning environment. Ms. White has made A, the implementation of literacy goals across all disciplines, and B, improved school climate, top priorities in the school system. Overall, Ms. White is a dynamic and innovative leader with a proven track record of providing excellent leadership to BCPS in these turbulent times. I do want to highlight that the NAACP is extremely concerned about the action of this school board and the unprecedented move by the state superintendent, Karen Solomon, to deny Ms. White uh, appointment as permanent superintendent of, of BCPS. We're also concerned about the lack of transparency associated with the external audit, and we do want to thank the board for putting the audit on the agenda uh, for this meeting tonight. And hopefully, we look forward to it being released to the community. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker for this evening is, just one minute, I have to, there we go. Uh, our next speaker is Helen Valiant. My name is Mrs. Valley, and I'm the ESOL teacher at Hollyburg Middle School. 
Um, I'm here to support Excuse me, students. just if you could speak into a microphone. If you want to stand, can someone give her the portable microphone? I just want to make sure we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. And that it's uh, recorded in the in the video. All three mics work. Oh, all three do? All three. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We want to make sure we hear you. Put on the spot. Um, my name is Helen Valley, and I'm an ESOL teacher at Hollaberg Middle, and I'm here to support the children uh, who are in AVID. So I'd just like for them to sh introduce themselves and share why they are a fan of AVID. Yeah. What's your name? My name is? Hello, my name is Vaughn Caldwell. I am a fifth grader. Well, I'm a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's class at Hollabird. AVID helped me to be successful because when I was in fourth grade, I found out why my mom was not in my life. I was bad every day. My teacher tried to teach me, but I made poor choices. Now that I am in fifth grade, I have patience and I know how to do my work without asking for help or saying I don't want to do that work. I am now a leader for my class and on the morning news, my teacher, Ms. Franklin, believes for, for me and I have faith in myself. I now know that was my past and I will have a good future. I am going to military college and will join the Air Force. Thank you. I am I am a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's class at Hollibird. Today I'm going to be sharing how AVID helped me. AVID has helped me so much, but first I will start with Cornell Notes. Cornell Notes most of all helped me to be stay neat. Mainly I love the left side of the page that ha is the question side or I can so I can ask questions. M The second thing that I love about AVID is my lovely teacher, Erica Franklin. She helped me get on my on the school's news, morning news. She believed in me. In closing, I now believe in myself, and I know it is all because of AVID and my lovely teacher, Erica Franklin. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Valiant, for all you do for the students. And thank you so much, students, to come to us this evening and speak about your experience. We're very proud of you and the work that you're doing and the work that all the students are doing. And I just want to go AVID. We really love it when the students come. Um, our next speaker for this evening is Dr. Bashvaran. Good evening to all. Uh, I'd like to special thank our chairwoman, Ms. Cozy. Last meeting when I spoke and I said good evening to all, he said welcome. And I want you to know that uh, no chairman or chairwoman or president or president woman ever told me welcome in the fast 15 years or so. So to build on that word, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Board of Education. Hopefully, you welcome each other's contributions and experience. So we have very dynamic chairwoman and vice chair and energetic. We have the knowledge and the experience and the compassion of Ms. White. We have the experience of Mr. Hayden in both school system and county executive before. We have all of you. And I really hope you as a board would work together, not as Republicans and Democrats, not as right and left, but to work together to solve the issues of the school system. So going back to the welcome, 
In 2004, 2005, I started my crusade, my Muslim crusade, of coming to every board of education and ask for equality in non-Komar holidays. There was a board member on the right side that used to turn her back when I speak. No names. And there was a board member on the left that used to play with her pocketbook, laptop, and other silly stuff when I speak. So that's really the reason why I really appreciated your word of welcome. Um, Many other board members did not really speak against those two board members. And as you know, when the calendar 2019-2020 was approved by you, only three board members questioned or noted, and the rest were silent. I encourage you not to be silent. I encourage you to work on equal holidays for all. I encourage you to avoid this calendar being used for the benefit, special perk for a small minority in Baltimore County. I really encourage you to cross that line. 25 years enough of waiting for that equality. Welcome matters, and the calendar is unwelcoming. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Joshua Marks. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. I am the AVID site coordinator at Towson High School, and I have the pleasure of welcoming two AVID scholars from Hollibird Middle School who are going to share their experiences about AVID. Hello, my name is Valeria Santos. I'm a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's classroom at Hollibird. Today I'm going to talk to you about how AVID changed my life. The first thing I want to talk to you is that I never knew the career I wanted to go. Only one of my parents went to college. Because of that, I thought I couldn't go to college either. Ms. Franklin always says that my parents' life is not my life. Ms. Franklin always pushed me because she was highest. She has the highest standards for me. I want to attend Towson University. I want to be a teacher like Ms. Franklin. This is how AVID helped me. Hello, my name is Haley Blazak. I am a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's class at Hollibird. Last year, I was not big on speaking up. Now I'm proud to say that I have learned how to self-advocate. Ms. Franklin says that I am very articulate, so she recommended me for the morning announcements. In class, we have learned about virtues. I found that I have the virtues of kindness, understanding, and tact. As we go throughout school, I'm becoming stronger. After I graduate from college, I will become a therapist. Now, with the help of AVID Elementary and Ms. Franklin, I found my voice. Thanks to both of you to, coming, to come forward and speak so eloquently to us. We really do appreciate it. Our next speaker this evening is uh, Dr. Muhammad Jamil. Welcome. Thank you. Peace and blessings to Chair Roman Kazi and Superintendent Ms. White. I think of all the board members, Dr. Hayden knows me. Uh, this is my 80th presentation to this board. I have interacted with every single superintendent since 1976 when Dr. Dubell was in charge. <laughs> the history of this board is that it evolved since, 19, uh, since 1816 when it was called the State School Fund Commissioners. Over this time, 
these managers have reflected the politics of the day. They've been racists, anti-Semitic, anti-black, and also anti-Islam. The seismic change that has taken place already demands that we should have someone who has been in the system, with the system, work with the system, vested in the system. We have someone who's a graduate of BCPS, a teacher in Baltimore City, then in 1995 joins BCPS. Later, this professional becomes assistant principal, principal, senior and executive staff member, under other superintendents, with a bachelor's of science degree in education, master's of art degree in leadership and teaching, having been an assistant superintendent, such person exhibits clear comprehension of the challenges that exist within the Baltimore County school system. Of course, I'm talking about Ms. White. Very proud to talk about her. I want to remind this board, this honorable board, that your children were not enrolled in any school outside of the BCPS. As a parent, it shows your commitment that the BCPS is the proper place for education for your children. Someone who is so much vested, he breathes in, breathes out, nothing but BCPS, spent a quarter century, sorry, but makes you look old with 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> with that kind of experience, I feel that uncertainty in, in creating a permanent position is a handicap for any organization. It impedes progress, and kicking down the can down the road is a negative precedence. Prompt and timely decision will build confidence in your management as a board. I'm sure the Baltimore County community recognizes the impeccable qualities and the expertise of our interim superintendent, Ms. White, as I've enumerated, and that this board will remove this uncertainty by confirming her as the permanent superintendent as soon as possible. God bless you all, and I hope that you do your due diligence. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Ross Kahn. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. My name is Reese Khan, and I'm a resident of Baltimore County. Both of these kids have attended Woodbridge Elementary School, a Northwest Middle School of Health and Sciences, and Woodbridge. Both of them are very smart kids. And I will give all the credits to the teachers and the principal. I'm very proud of my people, my teachers, and my principal. Ms. Phelps is an excellent leader. But actually, I'm here to talk about, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I forgot to mention Ms. White, Ms. Causey, and Ms. Hen, and my own Ms. Lisa Mack. Thank you for representing us. I'm here to actually talk about Ms. White. She is a product of Baltimore. It shows us the leadership quality we got within Baltimore area. We need to have someone, because I, when the affirmative action started in ni back in 90s, I told them in Washington, D.C., I cannot sit here and promote someone, support someone under affirmative action. I believe in the quality of the person. I cannot turn 10 into 20. And she is a qualified person. She's one, she's one of us. We need to stand up. We need to think beyond the color, religion. We need to think about the betterment of our kids. We need to stop playing the politics. I like Governor Hogan, I'm a promise to you in front of all these people, when I'll meet him next month, I will tell him this thing personally. I will speak with his administration, I will speak with his secretaries personally. And I promise to it, because we need to work beyond the party lines. It's not about Republican Party 
and who appoints you. We need to work for the people of Baltimore. We need to have someone that we can have. We cannot turn Baltimore County in Baltimore City, where we, we import our leadership from outside. We cannot afford that. We need to have who can understand the system and can talk about the system and be once part of the system. So when we say, Ms. White, I'm very proud of you. You know what? My kids will be joining the same schools that you've been through. And I'm very proud of you. And I'm very proud of Ms. Kazi, Ms. Han, and all of you. You guys do a great job. I'm very thankful to all of you. I'm not here to criticize anyone, but to say thank you. And please consider Ms. White for a permanent position. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Ms. Lori Phelps. Good evening and welcome to you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. My name is Lori Phelps and I am the proud principal of Woodbridge and my school is filled with families like the Cons. Uh, but I'm here tonight in a different capacity. I'm here tonight in my role as the president-elect of the Baltimore County Association of Elementary School Administrators, AESA. We are a professional organization of 118 elementary principals and assistant principal members. Our board meets monthly and we host professional development and networking opportunities for our members throughout the year. We discuss items of interest to our membership and our president meets regularly with the superintendent to share updates and ideas from our members. We often invite central office staff to our meetings and work collaboratively with CASE on issues that may impact both organizations. Our members are often asked to join district work groups to provide the principal perspective on various topics, including discipline and math curriculum. Our board wanted us to have a presence here tonight to thank you for the time that so many of you have given us in visiting our schools. Your sincere interest in what life looks like inside a BCPS elementary school and wanting to understand the challenges we face on a daily basis is obvious in your thoughtful questions and responses during these visits. Chair Kazi, we truly appreciate the number of times you have directly reached out to principals to ask for feedback and to know how the board can help us make a greater impact on student achievement. We told you all that we need more student resources in the form of school counselors, social workers, behavior interventionists, and social emotional learning experts. And you put those resources in the budget. This shows how much you value us and our expertise. We have one more resource we're asking you for tonight. The superintendent is the greatest resource you can give us and the most important of your responsibilities. You believed us when we shared what we needed in our buildings. We're asking you to believe us again as we share what we need to continue our work. As an organization, we support Verlita White as our superintendent. The reasons are many and the time is too little to list them all here. What we'd like to invite you to do is reach out to our members, each of you, reach out to our members and ask them for their personal reasons why we support Verlita White. You will learn about the depth of trust our members have in her and our willingness to do whatever it is that she asks to the best of our ability because we believe in her, in her integrity and in her leadership. As the search process continues, we want you to keep that thought fresh in your mind. As we say again, and again, we need you to give us Verlita White as our superintendent. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Ms. Brenda Pfeiffer. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Um, I'd like to address two topics tonight. First, the superintendent search. Thanks to your efforts to receive feedback from stakeholders throughout the county, the search firm has compiled this list of qualifications to look for in the next superintendent. While all are important, I'd like to highlight a couple in the brief time that I have. First, we need a superintendent who inspires trust and models high levels of integrity. 
We have had so many unethical things going on in the school system recently. Um, questionable relationships with companies and vendors, incorrectly completed financial forms and a perjury conviction, the shredding of thousands of documents in the face of an audit. It's time for us to have leadership with high standards of integrity so all stakeholders can begin to regain trust in BCPS. Also, we need a superintendent who promotes the positive and professional environment. Sometimes when I hear teachers express concerns about policies or programs in BCPS, I try to encourage them to email the board or to come to speak at a meeting. But I'm met with responses like, I'm too close to retirement and I'm afraid of what'll happen. Or, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying anything, maybe once I'm tenured. Or even, you can share what I said, but please don't use my name or identify me. We must have leadership who values what all teachers and staff have to say, even if they disagree with what's happening. Staff must no longer be effectively silenced because of a fear of consequences. I could go on about other areas in BCPS that need strong leadership to be addressed. Transportation is a mess, we heard about that earlier. Student behavior and discipline is getting worse, and there's a lack of transparency in the system that is alarming. Please look closely at all of the qualifications on this list and find a candidate with a proven track record in all of these areas to ensure we get the best leader for BCPS. And regarding the audit, I will just say this. Tonight we expect to hear the results of the first phase of the audit. And while this is a great first step and is something we should all be paying attention to, it is just that, phase one results. This will give us some of the information that we are seeking, but it certainly won't provide all the answers that we need. For that, we need to complete the full audit. Had the previous board begun the audit in the fall of 2017 when it was first asked to do so, we probably would have had much more, if not all, the information we wanted by now. However, despite that obstacle, obstacle, you are now moving forward with the audit in a timely manner, and we thank you for that. Now, please finish the job and continue to press on, complete the next phase of the audit, and seek all the answers that we need. Thank you. Thank you, and our next speaker this evening is Betty Fields. And I would like to give another round of applause to those children back there. They're doing a great job. Good, for you. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Can't believe I'm here. I guess I can't give you a copy of my letter? No? All right. At the end of your remarks, you can give us a copy, yes. All right, thank you. So good evening, my name is Betty Fields, and I've been a special educator for 31 years, 20 of which have been at Hillcrest Elementary School, and in addition, I've lived one mile from Hillcrest um, for 30 years. I know former students, parents, teachers, and I've seen firsthand the mission of Hillcrest and the importance of getting it right. It is Hillcrest's vision to ensure that each child develops a love of learning that will carry them throughout their academic career and more importantly, their life. Your first thought or question might be, how does Hillcrest do this? What is their magic formula? For me, that is a very easy question to answer. Our teachers, staff, and administrators embrace the philosophy that all students can learn Hillcrest is led by individuals who value others, their voice, and need for choice. We as a team work to build and implement a learning space for students where children are challenged to use critical thinking, analyzing, and transforming knowledge. How do we know if we are effective? The administrative team, faculty, and staff consistently review and evaluate data, which in turn drives the direction of instruction. In like manner, our PTA and faculty members have created and implemented a plethora of clubs, both before school and after, to provide opportunities of extending students' knowledge and interest. Equally important is comprised of great, Kilcrest is comprised of great teachers that form strong relationships with their students and show that they care about them as individuals. Hillcrest teachers are warm, accessible, enthusiastic and caring. Our faculty is known to come to school early, conduct working lunches, or stay late to make themselves available to students, parents who need them. This past October, Hillcrest celebrated the 50th anniversary and there was so much patronage of families and friends and community leaders attending, all feeling that extraordinary connection. 
the old expression that it takes a village is fundamentally significant today, but I would like to make one small addition. It takes a transformational leadership team to give direction and support to the individuals in that village. Dr. Jennifer Lynch, Michelle Webster, and Maria Ramos have made a categorical difference at Hillcrest Elementary School and have positively impacted the members of our community. In conclusion, with so much negativity in our world today, I wanted you to hear my voice, the simple voice of a special educator who is weary of hearing what is wrong with our schools and feel that here. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Erica Franklin. Good evening and welcome to all of you. Hello, my name is Erica Franklin. I'm a fifth grade teacher and I have a coordinator at Halliburton STEM. I want to turn my time over to the remaining two of my fifth grade scholars. Hello, my name is Patrick Smith. I am a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's class at Hollibird. This year changed my life. My teacher, Ms. Franklin, has high expectations of, of me. I have found my voice because Ms. Franklin always called on me last, last year. I was bad. I did not learn all that I could. Now that I am in Ms. Franklin's class, I found my voice. I, I'm a leader. I learned how to organize and take notes, and she helped me self-allocate. Avid helped me find the right college so that I can have a gr good career and go to, into the military. Avid helped me in real life by learning how to not worry with family issues and focus on my career. Hello, my name is Haley Pye. I'm a fifth grade scholar in Ms. Franklin's class at Hollibird. Today I'm going to be talking about how AVID changed my life. First, I'm going to talk about my career. Before I came into AVID, I was never really sure what I wanted to be. When AVID came into my life, all of that not knowing went away. Now I know what I want to be and what I would be good at. When I grow up, I am going to be a lawyer. The second way AVID helped me was with leadership. In the past, I was never sure how to lead. I was a follower, but now that AVID came into my life, it showed me how to be serious about learning, working hard, and never giving up. I even help people that have the same challenges I had. These are the ways that AVID helped me grow to be a better person. I would like to give a shout out to my amazing fifth grade teacher, Miss Franklin. I would like to say thank you for everything you have done for me and taught me this year. Thank you for teaching me AVID. It helped me a lot this year. I love all the strategies. You've helped me so much that I'm going into GT next year. AVID is amazing. Thanks again. We really love to hear the student voice. And thank you very much, Ms. Franklin, for all the work you do and all the teachers that help our students each and every day. We are truly grateful. Our next speaker this evening is Ms. Sharon Saroff. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board members, Ms. Causey, Ms. Hen, Ms. White. Most of you know that I am a special education advocate and that I spend a great deal of my time trying to get students with disabilities what they need. And I would like to say that in particular the school system has come a long way in the provision of the special education services to its students, but I can't do that. 
This year in particular, I have seen an incredible rise in the amount of parents who have contacted me in need of assistance in, in getting services that are required for their kids to access their education. I'm having to turn people away because I physically do not have enough time in the day to get to everybody's concern. The concern that I want to bring to your attention today is that of the twice exceptional child. And I think you've heard me speak of this child before. This is the child that is gifted cognitively. This is the child who also has a disability that without special education, without an IEP or a 504, they can't access what we take for granted. I have two such children in my home. We shouldn't have to fight to get these children recognized, especially since there are staff members in this county who are trained to work with these kids and who are trained to teach others how to teach these kids. But these individuals are not allowed a seat at the table because there are people in our county who still feel that if you have a disability, you can't possibly be gifted. And if you're a gifted, you can't possibly have a disability. And in case anybody is wondering, I'm a 2E person. I have dyslexia. And I got my master's degree and graduated summa cum laude. It needs to change. We need to service these kids properly and not continue to ignore them. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everyone coming forward this evening to, to speak to the board. There was also an opportunity to, for folks, for individuals to sign up for policies, uh, but we did not have anyone sign up to comment on the policies that are second reader. Um, so we will be moving on to our next agenda item, which is item F, the superintendent's report. Okay, everybody, get a good night's sleep and do well tomorrow, okay? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Okay. So good evening, everyone. At a recent board meeting and, and at last month's State of the School event, I shared how important the 10 precepts, beliefs, and values of BCPS are to me and to our progress moving forward as a school system. These precepts comprise board policy 0200. The state of our schools is strong, but we will only maintain that strength by demonstrating the integrity, honesty, and sincerity embodied in these precepts. They are so important to our future that a work group of former superintendents and educators and community members worked closely with me to develop an 11th precept focused on promoting honesty and integrity, following high ethical standards, and engaging all members of the community with openness and respect as consistent with the guiding principles, precepts, beliefs, and values of BCPS. To that end, I am implementing board policy 0200 by establishing Superintendent's Rule 0200. In addition to including the 11th precept, Superintendent's Rule 0200 includes five commitments. One, ensuring that the board's precepts, beliefs, and values are posted in every school and BCPS office. Two, ensuring that the board's precepts, beliefs, and values are prominently posted on the BCPS website. 
Three, incorporating the board's precepts, beliefs, and values into all of the school system's onboarding park programs for new employees. Four, recommending amendments to the board's precepts, beliefs, and values as appropriate. And five, ensuring that all em employees have access to training and resources supporting these precepts, beliefs, and values. I am sure that we can all agree that a back-to-basics approach with regard to equity, honesty, and integrity for students and staff is paramount and will serve us well and will serve as the cornerstone of our beloved BCPS. The work that we do with and for our children every day is legacy work. And I am proud to implement this rule in keeping with that legacy and in keeping with our rich history. Speaking of our leg legacy work and as part of our system-wide focus on literacy, BCPS provides comprehensive professional learning to support educators in helping students learn to read. Tonight's video focuses on how our offices in special education and, and in English language arts collaborate to co provide the support through a variety of strategies, including the Orton-Gillingham Reading Program. That collaboration is reflected at the school level, where our dedicated staff are using new techniques to support reading fluency. So let's show the video at this time. The dog stayed with him for a while after that. The offices of special education and English language arts have worked diligently to form a very strong partnership in addressing the literacy needs of our diverse learners in Baltimore County Public Schools. Bed. Bed. I love that I hear you. Through this partnership, we've designed a comprehensive strategic plan in which we are maximizing our resources and increasing collaborative practices, but in really building the school-based capacity in our schools to ensure that our teachers are meeting the needs of our students. We're gonna change out that beginning sound in our words. So, wed, wed. change w to b, and the word is? Bed. With letters training. Et, add m to the beginning. Bed. L, L. add b to the beginning. Bed. And a strong foundation of teacher knowledge around teaching, reading, and phonics. Bell. Bell. What the staff is noticing is an impact over time. We're seeing kids consistently apply rules and ask questions about language, which are really turning into productive and successful readers. What kind of syllable is your second syllable? Nice job. Orton Gillingham is not only a reading program, but it is changing lives. Our students are feeling confident, they're feeling successful, and we really started to see growth in these students. They are excited to open up books, they're excited to read to me, and they are uh, initiating literacy celebrations for themselves, which is really amazing to see. I think Orton Gillingham is not only an effective approach for the skills that they need, but it's very motivating and you can make it a very fun and engaging process where students feel like they're playing games and, and they're seeing the progress they're making in a whole new way and it builds confidence as a reader. It's really impressive to see the impact that it has on student uh, engagement, motivation and just overall leadership roles in a school building. You guys are going to work on two linkages today. You're going to work on two vowel teams, AI and AY here at the table. In BCPS we believe that all of our students are readers and that we have to provide solid core first instruction, tiered interventions, and high quality professional learning at all levels from elementary through middle to high school. It is our hope that the partnership that we've established between the offices of ELA and special education will extend to and support the collaboration we know we need in schools. So here at 7th District Elementary School, what we're seeing this year is marked improvement in scores. So the reality is, first we look at our data, and our data really does inform how we program for our students. But what we're finding is the increased effective first instruction based on this idea of collaborating either with our reading specialist, with our special educator, or with our social emotional learning teacher. And how we're able to do that is really looking at the best ways to support the whole child and using Orton-Gillingham, 
has shown us over time this school year that we have made such leaps and bounds in progress for students, but we also take very seriously the social emotional growth of a child. It's just collaboration for what's best for children, not about labeling or putting kids in places based on their needs or programming. We're programming for every child in every classroom every day. So again, we're just incredibly proud of our staff and of our, our teachers, our administrators who have a commitment to this literacy work. Our literacy work is our legacy work. Our literacy work is our equity work. And so it is paramount that we stay true to who we are, stay true to our precepts, values, and beliefs as a school system because this is our legacy work. And so I'm just proud of this work that we're getting done and hats off to all of our educators who are committed to literacy and BCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. And now it's time for the chair's report. Um, I do want to say the board members, we do appreciate hearing in so many channels here at the board, community visits, school events, social media. The community is commenting favorably on the board's level of engagement and efforts of governing. I, along with Vice Chair Julie Henn, who is really a co-chair, I'm honored to facilitate and coordinate the work of each board member and the board as a whole. Um, this board has been engaged just shy of four months, and we've worked through the capital budget, the operating budget. We have our committee meetings where we're doing engaged in the work of the school system in policy review, curriculum, audit, buildings and contracts. We've worked on the issue of the superintendent search. We've also uh, worked through the external audit, and tonight we will be hearing from the external auditor on phase one of the procurement audit. Also this year, we've worked um, much more uh, interactively with the Legislative and Government Relations Committee, and I want to appreciate our chair, Cheryl Pasteur, who is engaged with the legislati legislative around school funding, operating, and capital in a much more intense way this year, and we really appreciate her work because we do need every dollar for our children. So thank you very much for that. And we could not do all that we are doing without administration and staff going to extraordinary lengths to support us all. This is a tremendous amount of work that this board with eight new members has engaged in, in in such a short time. And I'm really grateful and I'm really honored to be alongside each of you on this journey. Our superintendent search, just recently we had more than 4,000 Baltimore County Public School stakeholders told the Board of Education what they want to see in the next superintendent. During a two-week community input period, citizens were invited to provide input by completing an anonymous online survey and also by attending uh, community forums and focus groups. We did that through the services of Ray & Associates Incorporated, an executive search firm that we engaged to help us in this process. We also conducted a numerous stakeholder meetings and open forums to determine qualities and characteristics most desired in the next superintendent. Those online surveys garnered 4,445 responses from the community. Ray and Associates shared with the board that this was the highest response that they've seen in years and could be highest in the firm's history, even um, out of bigger school districts. The board appreciates each and every stakeholder for taking the time to participate in the online survey and or meeting the search firm during those focus groups. Um, we were impressed with not just the quantity of the responses, but also the quality. Comments were available to be put into the online survey, and they were thoughtful and robust. The board plans to use all of this feedback in its current leadership search, but also in strategic planning moving forward. In addition to planning for future strategic efforts, <coughs> members of the board have been continuously participating in professional development, both locally through advisory panels and local uh, Maryland Association Boards of Education training, but also national. We went to a National School Board Association conference. It was great to attend this conference with several members of the board, and I really appreciate the sacrifice of time that they took away from their family and careers in order to do that. I also want to point out some things that are coming up. We have a uh, upcoming dinner with our advisory councils in a new format to focus uh, more intensely on their issues and input. We also have an upcoming dinner with our recs and parks where we have a wonderful partnership with that organization to provide not only youth activities but also activities for community members of all ages. And um, it's uh, very helpful for our school system to have that. 
while we do have a shorter break coming up for our spring weekend, our spring long weekend, we do want you to rest up and enjoy that. And we're also grateful that this board with the work of staff and the community that participates in the calendar committee, that we were able to have a full spring break added for next year. This is the only meeting that we have in April, so I wanna acknowledge special issues. This is National Autism Awareness Month, National Occupational Therapy Month, National Poetry Month, and our students are doing wonderful work around that, and there's lots of examples through our uh, website. School Library Month, we wouldn't be able to do our literacy without our library media specialists, so we appreciate that. Uh, we also have National Assistant Principals Week and SAT School Day. I just want to point out that Baltimore County Public Schools does offer an in-school opportunity for every junior to take the SAT, and that's one of the ways that we are providing equity around our county for our students to be able to achieve all that they can. We also appreciate our public school volunteers. We have International Haiku Day, and again, there's wonderful examples of that on our website. We have Administrative Professionals Week, and we're gonna give a special clap out to Ms. Tracy, who's done so much work for us. And also we have a special helper who helps out when uh, Tracy needs some extra support, so we appreciate uh, her as well. Um, we also have National Student Leadership Week, and we have Earth Day coming up April 22nd, and there's lots of learning opportunities around that. And again, I just wanna thank the administration and the staff at all levels for the work they do to support our students and our school system every day. And that's my report. Our next item is the student board members report. And for that, Ms. Adekoya. Good evening, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Tonight, I have a jam-packed student member report, but it's imperative I speak on everything. First <laughs> and foremost, I would love to give a huge shout out to our BCSC middle school team who rose to the occasion as they hosted our first mini leadership seminar for our beautiful Bedford Elementary Student Council. The day was comprised of incredible team building workshops, discussions, and reflections tailored around highlighting student leadership in our younger ones. With bringing the students to Greenwood, our magical cast for the day. The team led the way in evoking what it meant to be a leader and how their student council can create change in their school. It was a humbling experience interacting with the students on an interpersonal level, watching them share their intelligent and thoughtful perspectives during discussions as they enjoy their magical day at Greenwood. I also had the chance to meet with our remarkable health education team, Ms. Poja and Ms. Roller, who took the time to educate me on the current health education curriculum across grade levels. The health education team is working day in and out, making sure that we are focusing on whole schools, whole communities, and whole children. As we all know, health education affects all of us as individuals, and our students are continuously seeking more in terms of curriculum, tools, and resources. They recognize that we need more time allotted to be educated on the content, but also thoroughly practice what is taught. As a system and a state, we need more. Thank you to the Citizen Advisory Committee for gifted and talented students for hosting their monthly advisory meeting at my home school, Milford Mill Academy. I enjoyed gaining a deeper understanding about advanced academics in our county. Great thanks to our fantastic community superintendents for their presentation and question and answer series at the meeting. As a county, we have accomplished tremendous work, but we're going higher and we shall continue to strive for the best. The Chadwick Elementary Leading Ladies Club is a force to be reckoned with. The ladies in that club are intelligent, inspiring, motivating, beautiful, power, powerful, unique, simply put, one of a kind. I had the opportunity of being a guest at their meeting last Thursday, and might I say, I wish I knew what self-awareness was and meant at that age. But of course, I did not, so when I heard a young lady tell me that this is one of her favorite traits about herself, believe me when I tell you tonight, I'm still trying to collect my edges. They were wise beyond their years, pointing out the inequalities between genders in our societies and the societal changes that has occurred so far, further tapping onto what can be done in their community and around the world. And again, I am reminded of why I do what I do and why I serve. I serve for young ladies like them to know and to believe that they're under will never mean they're over, and their ambitions must always overshadow their situations, and there is not a can't in our dic dictionary only can and will. So tonight, I remind everyone, whether board members, staff, community advocate, and parents, it is because of the children like Bedford, Chadwick, and even our BCSC middle school team that we work. They must always be the reason behind the decisions, the reason behind our what, why, and how. 
Like Dr. Brown emphasized last board meeting, the decisions we make will always impact our children, their children, and their children. So what decisions are we willing to make that will still hold a positive, life-changing impact on our BCPS children? Additionally, hats off to the avid Hollabird scholars. You are all amazing. You guys can do anything and be anything that you want to be. The sky is not your limit. It is your beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adekoya. The next item of business is I, unfinished business, consideration of policy, board policy 8222, internal board policies, duties and responsibilities, superintendent, executive officer. Do I have a motion to adopt the changes to board policy 8222, internal board policies, duties and responsibilities, superintendent, executive officer? Thank you, Ms. Rowe, for that motion. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the Policy Review Committee. Is there any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Our next item is item J, New Business Personnel Matters. And for that, I call on Dr. Mayo to present. Good evening, Dr. Mayo. Causey, uh, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, non-renewals, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits J1 through J6? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. The next item of business is consideration of administrative appointments. And for that, I call on Ms. White. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Supervisor, birth to five, Office of Special Education, and Supervisor, Related Services, Office of Special Education. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K-1? So Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. We'll have Ms. Pasture. Thank you. All in favor, or is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The vote is unanimous and the motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to recognize the following individuals. I'd ask that you stand with your friends and family so that we can recognize and celebrate you. First, I'd like to recognize Karen Lorenas, who will be the new supervisor in Birth to Five Office of Special Education. Karen, do you have any friends or family here with you tonight? Okay, well, we're your new family now. So, <laughs> Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize uh, Lisa Melody, who will be the new supervisor in Related Services, Office of Special Education. <laughs> Lisa, do you have anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Wonderful, congratulations. <laughs> Madam Chair, that's our appointments. Thank you and congratulations again. Our next item of business is item L, action taken in closed session. There, Mr. There was none. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Our next item is item M, new business contract awards. For that, I call forward um, Excuse me, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, and Mr. Smith. Good evening. Good evening.
Just give me one moment. Sure. Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe, can you please, in Ms. Hen's uh, absence, address the contracts? Or I can. Sure. So the Building and Contracts Committee uh, voted to recommend uh, items uh, 1 through 13, recommended approval for the full board. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M13? Thank you, Mr. McMillian, for your motion. Uh, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion on the contracts? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next item on the agenda is item N, new business, external audit. For that, I call forward Mr. Regan. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, members of the Board of Education, my name is Jack Regan, and I'm a Managing Director at UHY Advisors, Mid-Atlantic Maryland, Inc. UHY Advisors is one of the top professional services firms in the U.S., and UHY International is one of the largest accounting networks in the world. We provide audit tax and consulting services to clients in a wide variety of industries, including state and local governments. We're located here locally in Columbia, Maryland. Personally, I've served local governments my entire career. Uh, during my 30-year career, which I'm coming up on in June, here in a couple months, I've served several large local governments such as City of Baltimore, Montgomery County, Maryland, Anne Arundel County, Maryland, the District of Columbia, and New York City, to name but a few. And I sincerely appreciate being here tonight to present to you the results of our performance audit. The schools issued solicitation LKO 423-18 on March 15, 2018, and it issued two subsequent addenda. We were awarded this contract in mid-May 2018, and we held a kickoff meeting in late June 2018. The scope of our work was specified in the solicitation document. We were requested to examine the procurement policies, processes, and procedures employed by BCPS over 18 specified contracts, which were awarded during the period January 1, 2012 through December 31, 2017. In order to better understand certain relationships between BCPS and its vendors, we then requested to review the annual financial disclosure statements submitted by BCPS board members and selected BCPS employees that were critical to the management and oversight of the contracts to be reviewed. We were also requested to review the travel expenditures, conference fees, professional memberships, and professional dues for the Board of Education, the superintendent, and members of the superintendent's cabinet for the same period previously described, uh, January 1, 2012 through December 31, 2017. The results of our testing only extended to those items specified above. They extended no further than that, so our report is just covering that scope which I described. At our kickoff meeting, we were instructed that certain members of the, the board at that point uh, 
were appointed called an ad hoc committee would be responsible for overseeing our contract. This ad hoc committee was an important way for the board to exercise its fiduciary responsibility of oversight of our contract. Further, BCPS also identified a small number of employees who would be our primary points of contact for data requests and other matters for contract execution. We met on a regular basis with this group throughout the conduct of our work to apprise them of our progress, discuss any questions that we had, and to ensure that the scope of our testing was appropriate. In fact, at a meeting with this group in November 2018, it was determined with the input from the ad hoc committee members that the scope of the testing over the travel expenditures, conference fees, professional memberships, and professional dues extend only to the members of the superintendent's cabinet. In a subsequent meeting, we determined that certain administrative professionals were making travel arrangements for persons that were considered in scope and we extended our procedures in this area to cover those administrative professionals. As part of reviewing the 18 contracts, we reviewed thousands of documents, including purchase orders, invoices, checks, and other documentation supporting the execution of those contracts. Similarly, we looked at thousands of contracts related to travel, conferences and professional membership expenditures, which included travel pre-approval forms, reimbursement requests, and supporting receipts, among other items. As I previously mentioned, we worked closely with the small number of BCPS employees in executing our work. If we had a question about something that arose during our testing, we went to this group to provide us additional information to assist us in resolving the matter. It is normal during the conduct of such of these procedures, such as these, for us to identify matters that we would consider for inclusion in our report. We provided these BCPS employees with a write-up of the matter, including providing the supporting documentation um, supporting our, our conclusion. We asked for BCPS to either concur with our conclusion or provide us with additional documentation to clarify the information we use to reach our conclusion. This working group also provides us with the official BCPS response to the matter, which was incorporated into the report that we've presented to you this evening. This give and take around potential matters for inclusion in our report is a normal part of the audit process, and this framework was established at our initial kickoff meeting. Once I felt comfortable that we had sufficient information to reach a conclusion that a matter should be included in our report, I then determined how the matter was to be reported. A matter that got presented in our report here, we considered either as a finding or an observation. A finding is a matter which includes, in, well, excuse me, which indicates that a board policy, a superintendent rule, a departmental procedure, or a state of Maryland law or regulation may not have been complied with. An observation is a matter which, in our judgment, could result in increased operating effectiveness or efficiency of the financial management operations of BCPS. Once we determined how these matters were to be classified, we then began to draft our report. The draft report was presented to the working group I previously described for their review. This working group provided us with additional comment and feedback on the report. Again, this is a normal part of the audit reporting process and is extremely valuable for ensuring the factual accuracy of the information that's provided or presented in the report. After we developed this draft of the report and after we received uh, the appropriate feedback, we provided a draft copy of the report to members of the ad hoc committee. The members of the ad hoc committee then reviewed this draft and provided us a series of questions and observations which again were extremely valuable in ensuring the completeness of the items presented in the report. The ad hoc committee was subsequently disbanded 
and oversight was then executed by the committee of, of the whole. The review by the ad hoc committee and the committee of the whole was another demonstration of the fiduciary responsibility executed on this contract by this board. And I can't emphasize this next point enough. Please note that while the comments pr were provided by both BCPS and the board, not every item brought up as a potential edit to the report by either BCPS or the board was made. The ultimate editorial control of this report was retained by me. Once the first round of edits was made to this draft report, second draft report got circulated. First to the BCPS working group, and then to the committee of the whole. This again is the way that the reporting process is meant to work. Comments were again provided by both BCPS and the committee of the whole for consideration in the final report, which I am presenting now. I see several three ring binders up there of the uh, the report. So now I'm going to go over the findings and the observations very briefly. Uh, we had one matter which we consider to be a finding. We identified that the timely filing of annual financial disclosure statements was not adhered to and needs to be monitored more rigorously. rigorously. Further, we believe that additional training could aid in the timely and complete filing of such financial disclosure statements. We had 12 matters, which we consider to be observations, six of which involve the procurement to payment process, and six of which involve the administration of the procurement card process used to pay for travel expenditures, conference fees, professional memberships, and professional dues. In the procurement to payment process, uh, we believe that the controls over the utilization of confirming purchase orders could be improved. Confirming purchase orders are utilized when an invoice is received that exceeds the amount that's available on a purchase order. We also identified that many BCPS financial management procedures have not been revised for a number of years. We recommend that such procedures be updated periodically, but not to exceed a three-year period for review. BCPS should also improve its procedures over the retention of pre-proposal activity documentation such as requirements definition, the scoring rubric, and scoring documentation, among other activities. BCPS has already begun implementing such improvements in order to comply with certain new federal grant requirements. While the Division of Curriculum and Instruction is permitted under Maryland law to follow a more flexible uh, procurement policies. We recommend that they adhere to many of the same requirements for non-curriculum instruction procurements as you impose you know, on, the, on the rest of the, um, of the schools as these represent industry best practices. Um, while BCPS does also avail itself of the use of cooperative contracts, where you're piggybacking on another locality's uh, already issued contracts, uh, which it, 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 and that is permitted by state law, it should ensure, you should ensure, that all the requisite documentation is maintained. BCPS has already implemented procedures to improve such documentation of the consideration of use of such contracts. And we also identified several other smaller matters which we made some recommendations on to improve um, around the documentation and improving uh, the, the quality of the documentation of the procurement to payment process. Now over on to the procurement card process. Uh, we had, did identify one card holder whose procurement card batches were not formally approved by their manager for an almost six year period. We recommend that BCPS establish a procedure to monitor such approvals to ensure that all such batches are reviewed timely. We also identified that managerial review of these procurement card batches was not always evidenced by a sign-off, uh, formal sign-off on the batches. Again, that monitoring control that I just described could be used to make sure that folks are initialing uh, and indicating their reviews uh, appropriately. Um, 
we recommend that BCPS modify its existing travel procedures to emphasize and document the consideration and use of approved Federal General Services Administration travel rates for travel and lodging. We further recommend that BCPS should improve its adherence to the required policy that all procurement card transactions be evidenced by a receipt uh, for the item purchased with the card. BCPS should improve its adherence to the required policy that overnight travel be pre-approved and evidence of that pre-approval be maintained. And then finally, we did identify one instance uh, where a credit card transaction was split into a series of smaller transactions uh, in order to meet the approved transaction limits. That's obviously not appropriate treatment. In conclusion, I want to reemphasize a few points. The review of the draft findings and observations and the draft report by the selected BCPS employees is a normal part of the audit process. The review of the draft report by the ad hoc committee and the committee of the whole is an appropriate exercise of the board's fiduciary responsibility to oversee this contract and again is a normal part of the audit process. And as I mentioned earlier, the final say on whether an item recommended for inclusion, exclusion, or editorial change that arose from the review of the working group or the members of the committee of the whole resided solely with me. I wish to thank Barbara Burnup, George Saris, and Melanie Webster for their assistance and support during this project. They were my working group. They were extraordinarily cooperative throughout this process. And I cannot leave without extending a, a sincere note of thanks to your internal auditor, Andrea Barr, as the liaison on this project. She was uh, incredible to work with in assisting me on just coordinating the efforts between my team and your team here at BCPS. And finally, I want to sincerely thank the ad hoc committee and this committee of the whole for their valuable oversight and execution of their fiduciary responsibilities on this project. Uh, this concludes my remarks and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to make a note at this point that as advised by board counsel, no motion is needed by the board. We are receiving this report. We are not approving it. We are accepting it. And we do thank Mr. Uh, Regan for all of the work that he has done with his team. And we greatly appreciate the work of our team. We know that they've been uh, really diligent and working very hard at this, including um, our internal auditor, Ms. Barr. So thank you for um, noting that. Also, I want to make a note uh, to our public and our stakeholders that uh, we have a web page on the BCPS website where this report will be linked tomorrow so that the entire report, including the appendixes, will be available uh, to the public. And if you go to the BCPS web page, you can look for that under the board leadership tab. And it's the, the spot is already there, and the link will be put up tomorrow morning. So with that, uh, if there are questions or comments, uh, Ms. Mack, and then we'll work our way around. Thank you, Mr. Regan. I've enjoyed being part of the process. I have two brief questions regarding the chart that outlines the financial disclosure statements that are on page 12. Can you um, explain the difference between the one asterisk versus the two asterisks that, that are used in the chart itself? Sure. Uh, there were two separate um, instances of document destruction. Um, the first occurred in, on April 27th. 
So the documents that were destroyed, um, as evidenced by asterisk one, occurred during that time. The document and then document uh, asterisks, the double asterisks, those documents were destroyed on August 1, 2018. The, the timing around that is the RFP was issued in mid-March. There were documents that were destroyed in uh, April. The contract was awarded in late May, early June, and then documents were destroyed on August 1st. So I, I wanted to make sure that the calendar of events around that was clear. Does okay, that make sense? thank you. Yes, it does. And that leads me to my second question. When you were going through, I'm sure, the boxes and boxes of documents that you had to go through to get through this audit, did you find any invoices or payments associated with the destruction of the documents included in this chart? I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I don't know how I would be able to identify something from invoices on a document that was destroyed, so I, I had no knowledge of any documents. I'm, I'm that actually were talking about a payment for the destruction of the documents. Oh, I did not look at that. Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillian. Mr. Regan, how are you? Well, thank you. Is it accurate to say that the original draft is different from the final report because of the details associated with staff and board comments? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Regan. I know you've been very patient working with us. And I asked you this during well, And you've been very patient working with me. Well, thank you, <laughs> even though I wasn't part of the ad hoc committee. Um, I asked you this during the closed session. How does BCPS compare with some of the other schools that you've studied locally, Loudoun schools, D.C., Baltimore? Where do we stack up? Well, I, I think spe specifically to these 18 contracts and the procurement processes that you follow, specific to the procurement processes that you follow or the payment processes that you follow for the travel, conferences, professional memberships, um, your uh, policies and procedures that you follow are appropriate for a school system your size and not substantially different than any of the uh, other large school systems that I've worked with in my career. Having said that, as a professional auditor, do you recommend a phase two? Uh, that's not for me to decide. That's for this board to decide. But, but would, you, would you have a recommendation that based on your findings in phase one, I strongly recommend a phase two or you're ambivalent about that? Again, that would be very presumptive of me and, and uh, taking away from the fiduciary responsibility that's being executed uh, by the board. If you choose to go forward, I would love to do the work. If you choose not to go forward, then that is the, the decision that the, uh, the board makes. So you don't strongly recommend that the phase two should be completed or should be done based on your findings. You're uh, just saying it's up to the board to decide. Again, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for me as a vendor to recommend that one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Well, Mr. Reagan, thank you for all that you've done on this. We appreciate your time and effort. <clears throat> I wanted to um, ask you a few questions specifically about the scope of this engagement. Uh, you mentioned that there were only 18 contracts that were outlined in the document, in the RFP, um, and those are what you focused on. Um, what I want to ask further about is the decisioning around um, which uh, individuals to review financial disclosure statements for versus uh, which individuals um, you review the travel conference and professional membership exp um, expenditures for. So my question is, as I look at um, page five, uh, I have a total of 37 people that you reviewed the financial disclosures for. Um, on page seven, or combination of six and seven, uh, I have a total of 28. And my question to you is, um, what, who, first of all, who made the decision as to who was going to be reviewed in, in either way? And uh, secondly, why is there a discrepancy? Why didn't you just review all of them um, 
and and travel for all all the folks on the first list. Sure. So the the uh, travel conferences, pro uh, professional memberships, etc. Uh, that was determined again by members of the prior ad hoc committee. So when determining the scope, and that was the group that put together the scope for the uh, contract, that was those were the people that we uh, selected. Um, when we got into looking at then following all those expenses through the process and seeing who initiated those transactions, a lot of times, again, there were administrative professionals who helped arrange the travel for those people that were considered in scope. So we expanded the review of those travel and professionals uh, expenditures to look at those cards that were used by those administrative professionals on behalf of the employees for whom they were making the travel arrangements. Okay, so that's how we got to the broader list on the travel, professional expenses, et cetera. On the financial disclosure forms, that was my call to make once I gathered uh, sufficient information about the 18 contracts and was looking at who were in some administrative and oversight responsibilities around those contracts. I determined the um, number of people, both from a board perspective and from a BCPS employee perspective as to what to, uh, to do. I did not believe it was necessary to reconcile those two lists because I saw them as two distinct different pieces of the work that we were doing. Okay. And just to be clear, um, and the, if, I, if I may, yeah. the 18 contracts that were specified, those were in the contract from day one. So there was no judgment executed by me as to which ones to look at. There was no judgment executed by anybody else. That determination was made um, during the RFP process. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just so, so that we're crystal clear, um, you made the decision on which financial disclosure, which individuals you were gonna review the financial disclosure forms for. Yes. That was your decision. And the decision is to <clears throat> the, the main people, not the um, executive assistants and the other credit cards that you're hunting down. Um, but, but the main individuals that you were gonna review for the, the travel conference and professional membership expenditures, that was decided by the previous um, ad hoc committee and uh, individuals involved in identifying who that should be. Yeah, and the, the decision was made to use members of the superintendent's cabinet on that, so that's how it cascaded out. And along with uh, board members? Along with board members, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. I move that we, the Baltimore County Board of Education, in an attempt to be transparent, release the original draft report along with the final report. Excuse me, but that point is out of order, and I'll have Mr. Regan speak to why that point is out of order, in that this board does not have control of the draft report. Mr. Regan, but is it true that that draft report belongs to you and not to this board? Again, from my standpoint, the draft report is just that. It is a working document. It is incomplete. And it is, I do not believe, appropriate to, to release a, a pre-decisional document that's a working document. But I think that members of the, um, you know, the, the board in consultation with council need to determine whether, you know, whether the release of that is appropriate. Mr. Nussbaum, could you excuse please give me, us legal excuse counsel? Me. Excused. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Nussbaum, we have been advised that pre-decisional information is not public information. Well, I, I don't know that the, I don't know that Mr. Regan's opinions on whether to release it or not makes the motion not appropriate. I mean, I think it speaks to whether the motion should be should be granted or not, but I'm not sure that the motion itself is not appropriate. 
appropriate. Our understanding from the from a former comment by you was that the internal draft did not belong to us, that the internal draft belonged to you. I, I don't recall saying anything like that. I recall saying that I do not think it's appropriate that a working document like that should be released. And part of my reason for why I was very reticent in starting to circulate drafts was this very reason. Because I get additional documentation, I get additional insight, I get additional information every single time a document like that circulates. There are absolutely going to be changes between these documents. That's appropriate. There is nothing wrong with that. But it's absolutely, to me, not appropriate for such a draft document to be circulated. It's just not. Mr. Kuhn, and then we'll work our way around. Uh, Mr. Nussbaum, I, um, I had a question for you. Um, previously, uh, when this very uh, idea came up, um, you had said that the working paper, which was the, um, the audit draft report, was not available um, because people were putting in Public Information Act requests for it. Has that changed? No. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pasteur. Okay, um, Mr. Reagan, when this went to the Committee of the Whole, uh, and I, I guess at our last uh, board meeting or some conversation um, uh, about this or in discussing this, um, I particularly asked the question because I was under the impression and took notes, um, and it had been asked whether this particular document, the first one, could be released. And I, according to the notes that I took, as I'm taking now, the answer was that it was still your property and that uh, at the point at which we wanted to release it, that uh, all of the things that you've said, there were still things that were being done to it. It was still um, a work in progress, um, if you will. Um, so we moved forward with that in our minds that it was um, still your property. And what I heard at the beginning of this is uh, something similar in that you were now releasing this one. So that's tantamount to the same uh, verbiage if, if you're releasing it, that it is yours. So now what, I, and, and I just want to get this right because I want to make sure that when this co has come up before and there was nothing said about um, releasing this, this is from our perspective, from the board, not with you, that tonight we are on the, um, on the right track because I can uh, call the question and, all, and support, which will eliminate um, all of this, and support uh, Mr. McMillian because it does not now, if, if I want to appeal or any of that, if I want to beg the question, if I want to do privilege, whatever, so we can move this on. Um, because I think, at, based on Mr. McMillian's question about um, the first report and the difference, if the public is going to see the second one, then they ought to be able to see the first one just as we did. Now, that does not mean that there was anything that was drastic that was changed, but they ought to be able to see it. So I'm get, I want to get from you just that clarification. I heard what um, Mr. Nussbaum just said, who sort of tossed that ball back. <laughs> we can, at this point, if we vote to have this, 
And then it'll be a matter of a vote. And if it's voted down, it's voted down. But the motion is on the floor, and it is a substantive motion. So, again, this is our choice as a board. Is that what you're saying? So then before I answer the question, do you need to respond to the motion? Point of order, there is no motion on the floor. There was a motion. It was... There is no motion. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 just... I'm in process of determining if it's in order or not in, okay. not in order based on questions and answers and our board council's advice. Okay. Okay. And, and to be what clear, say because and to, to be clear on something, there. This is not the second draft. This is the final, final report. Draft. Final. Final report. Words. Okay. Words matter. They cer words certainly <clears throat> do matter, Mr. Regan. They certainly do. They certainly do. We know that words do matter. All right. Final report. Excuse me. I'm going to have Ms. Hen, who's not yet spoken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Regan. Um, as you know, there has been tremendous public interest in this audit process, the timeliness of its completion, the actions around not releasing the initial draft of the, the report, the involvement of the ad hoc committee, et cetera. In your professional opinion, were there any actions by staff or by this board, any members, that give you pause as to the validity or integrity of the report or the process used to create it? No. Thank you. It was me. I was, excuse me, yeah, I, I will be considering everyone. Thank you. Ms. Adekoya has not yet spoken on this. How do we move forward? I could not hear the question. How do we move forward? That's for the board to decide. So the question to you from me is you previously said that it was your draft. And our board council wrote an opinion of advice to us that has been made public and is still on our website that it is not up to this board to release the draft. <laughs> so if we are receiving the final, so we need to understand is the draft belong to you or can it belong to us? Okay, cool. Uh, Mr. Nos Excuse me, I'm speaking to Mr. Regan. Okay, I can do it. I mean, the draft is a pre-decisional document. I have never in my career had a draft document enter the public domain. I do not think it's appropriate. I'm going to call a recess for five minutes to speak to council and I would request that everyone stay where they are. Liz, I'll tell you. Ridiculous. It's Reagan like the president. R E A G A N. Uh, John. He goes J O E J. He goes by Jack. Um, managing director, U H Y Advisors, Mid Atlantic. Advisors. 
That means that someone else made Ed perfect, Atlantic, which you had to say. Maryland Incorporated. Uh, not a problem. I have never in my 30 years in journalism had somebody make a presentation and refuse to spell their name for me, ever, as a reporter. Quite a night, quite a night, huh? Thank you. I call the meeting back to order. I felt that it was appropriate to take a moment to consult with our board council, given the information that we had received previously, that the draft document was pre Thank you. Given the information that was received previously and Mr. Regan's comments related to the highly unusual request being made, I thought it was important to consult with our board attorney and where the document is pre-decisional in that it was a working document, as Mr. Regan talked about an iterative process where uh, reports were given to management and they had comments and discussions. Report, a draft report was given to the ad hoc committee and then the committee of the whole board and there were comments and questions and it was an iterative process that resulted in Mr. Reagan's uh, decision to what was included in the final report. So my ruling is going to be that the motion is if Mr. If Mr. Reagan says that that in <coughs> draft report belongs to the Board of Education, then that motion is not out of order. But if the document belongs to UHY, then the motion is out of order. <laughs> Can I? The taxpayers paid for it. Taxpayers paid for all of it. Excuse me, if you would like to speak, then I will, I will recognize you. Okay, just one moment, please. The, it's very important, especially in the midst of an important decision and, and a decision that is highly unusual, for us to take a breath and proceed according to Robert's rules of order so that everyone will have an opportunity. I have asked Mr. Regan a question. Yep, you have. The draft is yours. Thank you. Okay. Then. Okay, now I'm going to get to talk some, right? Certainly. No, I'm going to, never mind. Madam Chair, I'd like to raise an additional point of order on different grounds. Um, Ms. Rowe. It was moved by the Committee of the Whole that the final document be brought to the full board for presentation. It was not moved by the Committee of the Whole that we um, pull the draft out of the Committee of the Whole. And so since the draft is still in the Committee of the Whole, debate on whether or not the draft should be released to the public needs to be done within the Committee of the Whole because that Committee of the Whole has not been discharged and the draft still remains with the Committee of the Whole. So the point of order that I raised before when someone motioned to make the draft public is the same grounds on which I'm raising this point is that an item that is in committee cannot be brought before the full board 
unless that committee refers it to the full board and the committee has never referred the draft to the full board. Okay, I've, I've had some chance to gather my thoughts for a second. Okay, Ms. Rowe, I'm going to take a moment before I rule on your point of order. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. Yep. Had I known that a draft of this would potentially get released to the public, which has never occurred in my professional career. And I've worked with numerous large local governments. I would have had to consider why such a draft would be released to the public. Was it an inappropriate attempt to influence my professional judgment and my independence by basically locking in whatever information was present at that point in time? The main thing you wanted coming out of this report was an independent third party conclusion on the documents that were in scope. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that had a draft of this been released during the conduct of the audit that it would again, make me have to consider whether or not I was independent of mind, of fact, and in appearance in being able to issue this report. And candidly, I fear that I may need to do that now. So I'm, I need to evaluate whether or not it is now appropriate for me to release this report in light of those facts and circumstances. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to um, concur with Ms. Rowe's point of order that the issue of the internal draft report needs to be dealt with in the Committee of the Whole. We will arrange a meeting at that time, at a time to address that. But this evening we are receiving the final report from Mr. Regan and that is what we need to do. That is what our community wants us to do. It's what the school system wants us to do. It's what our funding partners want us to do is to work within the confines of typical normal conduct of an external audit and to receive the final report on phase one of this audit. So I'm going to concur with her. That motion is out of order. Are there other questions for Mr. Regan? Yes. Sure. Is that, that's unbelievable. I have my Excuse hand up for the last one hour. It's, it's Excuse ridiculous. Me. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, Mr. Reagan just said that he wasn't sure if he was going to actually release this to us based on the the motion to try and make a draft available to the public. Uh, what we've talked about in the past and we've consulted with our lawyers about was working papers are protected by the and they're not even public you know, like MPI aid. You're not allowed to try and get them via Public Information Act request. So I don't quite understand how that changes now, my understanding was those documents, all of his working payment papers up to the point where he provides the, uh, the final report were um, confidential because they were all stamped and, and protected. So um, I'm not quite sure where that leaves us at this moment. We intended to receive the report so that the public could have it, and now people are trying to stop that from occurring. Mr. Kuhn, I've already addressed that issue. I've concurred with Ms. Rowe that, we, that it is an issue in the Committee of the Whole that we are not dealing with that 
in this evening, we will have to convene a meeting of the Committee of the Whole to address that issue. So we're moving on to other questions from other board members. Who has not been heard from yet this evening? There you go, Mr. Hayden. Okay, Mr. Hayden. The Ms. Committee. Rowe, would you please reference so, Robert's Rules of Order? So the Committee of the Whole is still a committee, even though that committee encompasses everyone on the board. The Committee of the Whole is chaired by Mr. Russ Kuhn, and we are currently in general session. We are not in Committee of the Whole session. If we move to go into Committee of the Whole session right now, it would be a closed session, and we would have to ask everyone to leave for the duration of the closed session. We can't because. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Excuse so, me. We excuse point me. Of order. Excuse me. Excuse me. We will have one person speaking at a time because it is important for each person to be heard. So we will do that one at a time in an organized fashion. Mr. Hayden had the floor. rules you can do that but we can open it up for logical discussion so that our community can understand what's going on and know where we're going and it's important that we do that one of the reasons for looking at the uh, the uh, first uh, draft if that's what the name of it is is because there was a lot of conversation about that the differences were relatively minor as uh, I understand in case I read it wrong uh, so what does it hurt to release the first one as well as the second one aren't we picking nits here this is something we've spent an inordinate amount of time that we've wasted an inordinate amount of time on and uh, in business, most of the people who stretched this out would have been fired already. Um, I'm going to, once again, Mr. Regan, ask you to speak to the question of releasing, th that is, what <clears throat> has this ever occurred to you before? No. And okay. that includes working for several years on the audit of Washington, D.C. while it was under Congressional Control Board authority. And I issued qualified audit opinions, pretty scathing management letters uh, about the financial reporting environment at the district. Not once was a draft document ever released. Okay. As, as was said earlier, it's a, it's predecisional. It, there's, you know, the, the drafts were just those drafts and confidential. Okay, thank you. It remains, it remains uh, that I concur with Ms. Rowe that we will, if the board wants at a future date, reconvene the Committee of the Whole to address that issue. Um, there are other board members that have not asked questions yet of Mr. Regan, including myself, so are there others that have New questions? Okay, I did not ask any questions yet of Mr. Regan except relating to that point of order, so I'm going to just ask you two questions. The following, I just wanted you to confirm based on a question, uh, the following policies were not in the scope of phase one. 3123 financial reporting, 4008 data governance, Ethics policies 8360, applicability and definitions. Ethic policy 8361, statement of purpose. Policy 8362, gifts. Policy 8365, lobbying. And policy 8366, ethics review panel. Those were not included in the scope of phase one. Is that correct? The, the items that were in the scope are included on page three of the report. And 
again on page nine. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, you had discussed with us previously, and I'd like you to just review discussing the typical actions by management and a board in addressing the findings and recommendations. Yeah, and generally speaking, the board will ask for a member of BCPS management to develop a corrective action plan for each of the findings and observations. Those findings and observations, the corrective action plan will state what is to be done, when it is to be done by, so when is the new policy or procedure going to be implemented, and who is responsible for the implementation of that new policy and procedure. So you'll get a corrective action plan, and then the board generally tasks someone with monitoring the implementation of that corrective action plan uh, at entities similar to this. I've seen that um, monitoring the corrective action reside in the Office of Internal Audit. So would you recommend the board as a whole uh, developing the recommendation for the interim superintendent as to developing a correction plan, or would it come from Building and Contracts Committee, for instance, that does address uh, procurement policies and procedures? I mean, if that's the committee responsible for procurement policies and procedures, that's an appropriate place. If the you know, Finance and Audit Committee is another place that I've seen this done as well. So we, we have an Office of Internal Audit. We don't have a Finance and Audit, but so it could be the Office of Internal Audit. Uh, oh, I thought you were speaking about the committee structure of the board. I apologize. Yes, no, I'm just trying to understand the different ways in which the board can move forward because really what's important here is that in the final report, there are recommendations. And what the board wants to do is to present the final report to our public and to then let them know that we are going to review it and we're going to use it. This is not a waste of time. This is not a waste of effort. Our staff has worked tremendously hard on this. And there are, as Mr. Reagan pointed out, there are improvements that are already underway. <coughs> Ms. White and her staff have already started as issues were being brought up to make improvements. And so it's incumbent upon this board to continue in our fiduciary duty, to continue to work on the improvements that we can make. We understand that we need every single dollar to be used the most effectively, the most efficiently, to the benefit of our students. We have tremendous needs, and that is our job. So I appreciate your comments, and I do want to say that we will be working on that as a board to determine which path we will use, which, whether it's a committee or the work of the board as a whole. Um, I will be putting an agenda item on that for the next meeting. Ms. White, we can discuss that, and Ms. Hen. Um, to let everyone know that this report will be used to the benefit of the students. Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. So White. I'm pretty sure that I haven't had an opportunity yet. Okay. So I'd like to take that opportunity at this time. First of all, thank you, Mr. Regan, to you and your team um, for your hard work uh, that you've done to give us the feedback that we need to move forward. Um, I am incredibly proud of our team, uh, the way that the, the small group that you talked about who worked with you to get you the information that you need to move forward. To, to address Ms. Causey's concern, again, I, and as I've said before, this is not our first rodeo. Um, we have annual audits, we have legislative audits, we have the um, internal revenue service audits, we have multiple audits every single year. There was just an audit uh, that was done by Clifton Larson Allen in November, and there were no questions by the, the, the board at that time. Uh, so there, this, these audits uh, are always followed up by extensive monitoring, action plans, uh, follow-up, follow-through. I'm incredibly pleased that when we see this, again, I think we may be missing the forest for the trees here, um, that what, does, what did we learn? I hope, I would hope that everyone listening and following would be pleased to hear that there's no scandal here. And I think that that is really important for our community to know. A community who is looking for stability, a community who's looking for us to see if our procurement practices are sound. 
our procurement practices are sound, certainly, based on these recommendations, we have some tweaks and adjustments to make, just like with every other audit. And we have some things that we can do better, technology solutions to paper kinds of processes, those kinds of things that you heard about tonight, tightening up of timelines. Those things have to get done. And so we know that those recommendations are important, and we will always follow up on those kinds of recommendations. But I would hope that as we're looking to stabilize and progress this school system, our beloved BCPS, that we can take solace in knowing that our people are working with the highest levels of integrity and ethics. That's why I called for the audit on September 26, 2017, <coughs> for that reason to get us back to who we are. We are BCPS, and we are BCPS strong. And I don't need approval to do that. I asked the question, and my question of privilege is about my appeal. Thank you. I called for an appeal when you first um, rejected the, the vote. That's my right. I even said when I called it that, um, and, and explained why I wanted a vote and I'm entitled to have a vote. I said either we have a vote, the vote wins, or the vote loses. Everyone who spoke after that was out of order. So all of that about a meet, the committee of the this and the committee of that, everyone else was out of order because nothing supersedes my, my um, appeal. So I am now going to do it again. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. And I thank you so much for what you have done. I really and truly do. I really and truly want this audit to get out. Yes, I really do. But he asked. He made a motion. And if we're going to talk about how we do things correctly in Robert's rules, then I know it, too. And when I asked for that appeal, and you did your due diligence when it was brought up and you said, no, I did my due diligence by asking for an appeal. Ms. Pasture. And I want that vote. Ms. Pasture, if you have uh, called a point of privilege, you are correct. And if you would like to appeal my decision on a point of order, please move forward with that. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Yes. I appeal Mrs. Causey's decision. Second. Sorry. I think we need to understand why she's appealing. I am appealing the decision we have asked. It was done once before in open session. I did not at that time appeal because, not because I didn't know, but because I was under the impression that we could not move forward without your sanction and it would have been a moot point. So now that we have all of those pieces and we're here tonight and we are where we are, Mr. McMillian made a motion. I want, and I'm appealing because it just, it, it just became convoluted. We've been out of order on this. I'm feeling his pain because he did his due diligence, but he asked for the motion. And it was just, I appealed when someone jumped on it, whoever it was, I appealed it at the time. So now this appeal is because everyone after I appealed was out of order. And so I want us to go back and take the vote. Excuse me, Ms. Pasture. Okay. Excuse me, Ms. Pasture. If you want to appeal my decision on a point I of did. order, yes, then you need to, to uh, tell did. me why you think that my point of order decision was incorrect. No. She, the, no. The, once the, if there's no an way. appeal in a second, it's debatable, and then it it's has to be voted It's debatable. I don't Thank have you. to do that. Um, Ms. Rowe. So. Then Ms. Hen. I do not believe that there are grounds um, for the motion to go forward because unless somebody can point out in here, in this book, we're not debating in this motion whether or not we should release the audit. 
we're debating whether or not the motion was out of order. And something that is in a committee of the whole that is confidential and in closed session cannot be moved to the general meeting without the committee of the whole moving that. And I don't believe there is any kind of BCPS policy that allows us to make a confidential document public without doing that deliberation in closed session. Otherwise, we would discuss student data in open. So I think the motion is out of order. Uh, we're, okay, we're I'm doing the same thing. It's still out of order. I, I, and we did I, your motion at the last one in open Ms. Pastor, session. Ms. Pasture, what I'm doing is I'm having discussion on your Thank you. motion. Thank you. Just my motion, my appeal, period. Your appeal can get to the point of the question. Well, if that get it, get there. Ms. Hen and then Ms. Jose. Um, yes, I would like to ask Mr. Reagan if you would please restate your concern around this questioning and the possible ramifications of the discussion you're hearing right now in terms of releasing the final report as it stands, please. Uh, again, again, had I known that a draft confidential document <coughs> would be released Again, that sort of sticks a line in the sand as to and establishes an expectation as to what the report would eventually say. And again, I would consider something like that an inappropriate attempt to influence the ultimate issuance of the report and the contents that, that were therein. So I mean, that's my, my great concern. And again, I've never had that happen. Uh, you know, you, you, the question was asked by one or more board members, you know, whether there was, you know, any attempt to try to influence me this certainly would have constituted something like that. And it's, and to me, I, I'm, it, again, it's never happened to me in my career. That's, and that's why I, I just don't know how to react to this. Thank you. Um, Ms. Scott. It's what's appropriate oh. is to make sure that every voice I'm is sorry, heard. I'm sorry, though. No, you can go ahead and go. No. Um, I was. My question was: was you had said before, like if you were asked earlier if there was an attempt to influence your decision, like that. But so you're saying that releasing the draft and, as well as the final, you feel would fall into that. Is that what you're saying? If if I understand that correctly, or did I? Um, I, I do have some concerns about that. Um, Could you expand upon that a little bit more? Because I'm, I'm. Because there, there are changes. There are absolutely changes. Mm -hmm. I've said that time and time again. That's the way the process is supposed to work. Okay. Yeah, and we're in in agreement with that. I guess I was just trying to find out more of why um, you felt that those changes are releasing that information, showing both the changes from the draft to the final. Would show they're, they're draft a new influ influence because they're oh. <laughs> again. I just I can't go back in time. Again, my point is, had that draft been released, you know, months ago, it would have been a marker as to what the final content of the report was going to be when there was no final report to be issued at that point. That's my o overarching concern is, you know, again, the draft exchange going back and forth, it's absolutely critical to make sure that all of that information gets vetted appropriately by all levels whether it's BCPS employees, the ad hoc committee, or the committee of the whole. 
And thank you for expounding on that. Okay. Ms. Joes. My. Sorry, pre-decisional documents only mean something that can be held. It doesn't mean it has to legally be held, from my understanding. Once we release that final report, everything coming up to it is also not no longer pre-decisional. And I work for the governments, and we release draft reports all the time, sometimes for up to two years while we're working on dra the final report. And that doesn't mean that people are not going to look at the at your final report. That is what is your final report, your final say. It just shows the people, the taxpayers who paid, in keeping up a transparency. This was the draft report. These were the comments. This is the final draft that you are signing and sealing. And let the cards fall where they may. I, I don't understand the resistance to release a draft report. That is not the final report. Governments release draft reports all the time. It is a final report is what we are looking at. Nobody's going to look at the draft report and say, oh, well, that's what he said. No, the final is what is decisional. But once we release the report, the pre-decisional, from my understanding, Andy, you may step in, and this is something I've heard from a lawyer, is it also predates all of the other documents. And we can release the draft. Is that correct, Andy? Yes, I mean, I believe that the, that the, the, the nature of the pre-decisional um, report, the draft report, was that it was not subject to a Public Information Act uh, request and wouldn't, should, not, should not have been and, and would not have been uh, released under, the, uh, under a Public Information Act request. But now it's, it's up to the board. I mean, the board can decide one way or another. But again, keeping in mind what Mr. Regan has said. Right, but this is also a government organization. This is not Messrs. Pasture that's running an audit report. This is paid for by the taxpayers, and we have to be very cognizant of that, that we have to be transparent if that's what the people want to see. We show them the draft. We show them the comments. We show them the final, plain and simple. I don't understand the, the fight for it. Thank you. I think what's been stated here is that we have an executive professional presenting to us a final report who has said that it is not only highly unusual, it never happens. I, for one. Well, I, I, I can't say it's never happened. It has never happened to me. <clears throat> Thank okay? you. And I do not think it's appropriate, but it's. OK, my question is, we will receive the final report tonight. Okay. Mr. Nussbaum, what I need from you is a ruling on whether the decision of the board to um, receive, to whether the decision of the board to vote on an issue related to the Committee of the Whole, do we need to go into a closed session for the Committee of the Whole? A, no, but B, this is still, there's still an appeal of the chair's ruling that's pending. So that has to be voted on. I know, the appeal of the, ch of the we're having discussion around the appeal. Okay. If, if in fact, Ms. Rose, Robert's Rules of Order discussion related to an item belonging in the Committee of the Whole cannot be come out to the full board in an open session unless it's recommended by the committee. It's, That's it's, the issue. If she's incorrect on that, then we can move forward and vote on Ms. Pasture's mo With all due respect, I think she's incorrect on in that. You all have had a discussion here for the last hour or so about the report. So the report is not in the committee as a whole. It's before the board. So the, the report is before the board. The motion that was made is incidental to that report. I don't see how that's in the committee as a whole. But again, that's subject to the appeal. You, you, the chair made a ruling. That ruling is now under appeal. So the next step is to take a vote on the appeal um, to the chair. Well, I think it's going to be much easier to take a vote now that you have uh, clarified that for us. So thank you very much. I want to say this to uh, Mr. Reagan. I, I'm um, sorry. Has everyone spoken? I think Halima had had her hand up okay. related to this. Thank you. Go ahead. So I thought I was going to wait until board member comments to say this, but I am highly, God sees my heart, highly disappointed at the way that this board has acted tonight. And it's very disgusting. We have just put on an entertainment show 
for the past hour that we have discussed this. It has brought laughter to us. And it, sh it like breaks my heart because we have those conversations where we're going to be nice to each other, we're going to be um, respectful, but what we have just done right now, and Mr. Reagan, I apologize on our behalf for the way that we have interacted with you and treated you. But I am highly disappointed and disgusted by the way we have acted. Little kids cannot even watch the board meeting because of the way we bicker and go back and forth with each other. I think the point is, is that we are trying to use Robert's rules of order at per board policy. But you don't have to be rude. In you don't have to be. Or I That's promise correct. you, That's it's correct. middle school bickering. We are middle schoolers at this point. Hollywood Middle School represented middle school better than we are representing middle school right now. The, the purpose of Robert's rules of order is to provide the process whereby people get the opportunity to speak. So I appreciate you sharing your comments, but we need to continue with the process. I think, Ms. Uh, I'm going to move the question. Wait, let me just, I want to say something to him, please, because it is my appeal. I want to say that I, I really felt when I looked at the questions and everything that we went through that there might be a problem. When I looked at the final draft, and I remember something that Ms. Hen said in terms of the way the questions might look in the form that they were sent. So I had that in my head. When I looked at your final draft, there were some changes. However, there was nothing that I thought was either egregious or anything that shifted the paradigm that it essentially had the same sail, the same smooth sail that the first one had had. And considering the amount of time and the number of people who have asked to see it along the journey that you have said was quite appropriate, I think that the motion he made says, let's show the public that there, and Ms. White also pointed this out, that there was nothing, nothing that was in the negative about the first one or the last. The best way to assuage all doubt and all questions and all angst is for people to understand that. This is transparency at its finest. If there had been a marked difference I could get it, but there really isn't. It's fine-tuning. You said it when you presented. It made it better. It made you better in the way you answered the questions and addressed it. Everyone should be able to see that so that they know that this, after all of these months, really ended up being a fine hour, because that's how I felt about it from the first one to the last. And I think I agree with um, what Ms. Adekoya said. If we're going to go by Ro and what you said, Mrs. Causey, if we're going to go by Robert's rules, then let's do that. And it didn't happen. But I'm going to use this because I'm a teacher as a teaching experience, and we're all going to learn from what happened in here tonight, dag on it. So now can we get to my appeal? Okay, we're going to take a vote. Okay, let, let me just, because this is the first time I think in my experience that this board has had an appeal of the chair. So let me just read the, what Roberts talks about because it's a little bit different than what you might might think. Certainly, Mr. Newsom. So, so the according to Roberts, the question that is is Are you speaking in a microphone? Because yeah. I think not I think I, can well hear you. yes. <laughs> the the according to <laughs> don't, don't wait a minute, let me let me put it down. According to Roberts, the question that's put to the body is shall the decision of the chair be sustained? And those uh, in favor of sustaining the chairs should say aye. Those opposed to sustaining of the chair say no. Okay? And a majority or tie vote sustains the decision of the chair. So the, so the vote that's taken is, the question is, shall the decision of the chair be sustained, even though it sounds like it's the opposite anyway. And uh, the, uh, those in favor of sustaining the chair, uh, the chair's decision vote yes, those opposed say no. And it takes a majority of no's to reverse the chair. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Does everyone understand? All those that want to reverse the chair. No. 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 
No, S all those in favor sustain. of sustaining the chairs vote yes. All those in favor of sustaining the chairs vote. Yes. Vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Those opposed vote no, and we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Hayden? No. Ms. Enquist? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Cosby? No. Ms. Joe? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Morales? No. Okay, so thank you. What I appreciate is the clarification from Mr. Regan that this has never happened to him, but it has happened, and f to Mr. Nussbaum for clarifying those other points. So the motion is in order, and Mr. McMillian, you made a motion? Yes, please. I move that we, the Baltimore County Board of Education, in an attempt to be transparent, release the original draft report along with the final report. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Pasture has a second. Any more discussion? Ms. Rowe. I would just like to ask for clarification from Mr. Regan. If we pass this motion to release the draft report along with the final report, are you still releasing the final report or are you viewing releasing of the draft as an attempt to undo influence the final report? Because I was confused by what you said earlier. I said that at the, if the draft report were released back in time, that absolutely would have been. But the final report is the final report. So is it your view that releasing the, fi releasing the draft with the final does or does not compromise the integrity of the final? Uh, it doesn't compromise the, in the integrity of the final at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other discussion before we vote? All in favor of releasing uh, roll call? Oh. Mr. Kuhn? Yeah, my, my only point here is um, this, like uh, Mr. Regan has said, this is um, highly unusual and seems extremely inappropriate when it comes to auditing standards. And my concern is if we actually take this action at this point in time to go back in time and release a draft along with the final, we are telling any and every vendor that every does business with us in the future that regardless of professionally what they do and how it's supposed to work, we don't care. We are just going to do whatever we want, and we're going to make everything available, regardless of how it's handled, in in uh, you know professionally. Ms. Scott. Thank you. Yes, um, Ms. Jones, didn't you say though previously in government that draft are released all the time um, before the final, and didn't you say that you haven't done it, but that it has been done respond? before? Yes, if you may respond. All right. Thank you. So yes, government agencies, EPA, City of Baltimore, release, release draft reports, and like Mr. Regan said, if we had released it before the final, then yes, it would have hampered his uh, final report. We are releasing the final report, so in no ways is that considered out of order or uh, what did what was the word you used that it's not professional I don't think it's not professional I mean we and the draft to reiterate what Ms. Pasteur said has not changed drastically from the from the final it's not like he had 27 findings and it went to 52 it's pretty much the same it's just made it clearer there's a lot more uh, columns and um, pages that he's added so it's not changed and I don't think it in any way undermines his professionalism because it to my, from what I've seen, it's pretty much the same report. Just clearer and a bit more refined. Mr. Regan, would you like to respond? No. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn, and then we're going to vote. I, okay. I'm just suggesting to everyone that this is setting a precedent that perhaps we don't want to do. Um, uh, that's, that's it. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say I'm, I'm truly conflicted here. I would defer to the expertise of the professional, Mr. Regan, in informing, consulting this board whether or not it's appropriate to release the draft. 
I've heard Mr. Regan say that it's not appropriate. My own values of transparency or what are at conflict because I do believe as a product that the taxpayers have paid for, they are entitled to see it. So that that's my conflict here. Again, I'm not an auditor. He is in his professional judgment. I respect <coughs> that. But again, I'm conflicted as to whether or not this should be released. And um, I understand the public is tremendously interested in it in the interest of all transparency. Normally there would be no question. However, we have an expert who's the professional in the room saying, and, and I took a note what you said, Mr. Regan, I have never in my career had a draft released to the public domain. That gives me tremendous cause for concern. So I don't know how I'm gonna vote for this. I'm tremendously conflicted because I see both interests competing with, with what this board should do. But I thank you for your courage and sharing your opinion with us, Mr. Regan, and your time on this. Thank you. Okay, we are going to vote on Mr. McMillian's motion. All the, we're gonna, Ms. Gover, we're going to do a roll call vote, please. Uh, could we restate the motion, please? Mr. McMillian, would you please restate the motion? I move that we, the Baltimore County Board of Education, in an attempt to be transparent, release the original draft report along with the final report. Thank you. I vote yes. Mr. No. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Ms. Hens? No. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. The motion carries, so we are going to release the draft report alongside the final report. Ms. Gover, if you would make a note to ask our staff to make that change when they um, make that. Um, that did take quite a bit of time, but I do appreciate us using the process to allow everyone to have their opportunity to speak, to work through the process, and to have Mr. Nussbaum clarify and also to have Mr. Regan clarify. There were, um, did anyone have any other questions or comments related to the audit? Thank you. Ms. Pasture. Yes, I want to ask since it came up about phase two, um, and I'm not sure whether this is just to Mr. Regan or whether this is to the three of you on the past board. Um, I, I, I'm trying to get in my head because I wasn't there when the first board did it and made that decision. And I, I know Mrs. White brought up the idea of the audit um, first. So my question in light of this audit coming out would be, what would the purpose be of doing a phase two? Why would we do that? And I don't know to whom I'm asking that question. Oh, I, okay, I guess I'll start with you, Mr. It's Lee. not appropriate for me to comment on that. Okay, so that is a question that I need to take back then to our board at some other time, Mrs. Yes, Clausey. I would suggest that we discuss it as a board at another time. Okay. There, just to clarify for you also, and for also for the public, that on the web page that our staff has prepared for the final audit report, um, it also has on it the scope of the, the original contract for the audit services, and it does outline phase one, and it also outlines phase two. So for anyone in the public, and uh, when we discuss it as a board, that's an item that the board w members should read in order to be prepared to discuss that, uh, you know, when we decide as a board to bring that up, which is not tonight. <laughs> Ms. Pastor, just to Thank offer you. a clarification, um, also, and again, that information I'm sure is online, as Ms. Causey said. Um, at phase one, again, it was a lot about, mostly about procurement and procurement practices. It was about those technology contracts that um, were in question. It was, a, the, even the scope of phase one did expand. So I know that the financial disclosures, for instance, were not originally in, and then they were in in phase one. So that the um, the nature of phase one was expanded even even from the inception of it. So a lot of that um, that was 
um, originally set, I guess, over time was completed in phase one. And this scope did expand, but that information can be found online. Sure, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Just one more question. I didn't know, I was trying to understand, is phase two already paid for, or would that be an additional payment, and how much would that be? Do phase we know that? two has not incurred any expenses. So Mr. Regan and his team will be billing us for the final amount of what they have done up to, and including presenting the final report. Okay, so phase two then would be a new amount if we were to do that, is that correct? Ms. Scott? Yes. And do you know what that amount Ms. Hen? would be? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll read from the RFP, and the RFP does contain the technical specifications for both phase one and phase two. Phase one, the scope was 18 contracts. Phase two is a review of 180, 180 contracts, valued in excess of one million. Um, phase two is to be priced separately from phase one, and is to be approved at the end, the completion of phase one. Scope of work, including proposed sample size for phase two, um, should be explained as required. So there is additional information that is all contained in the RFP, which can be found on the board's um, webpage around the external audit, which was published today. Mr. Regan? Yeah, and just as a point of clarification, because you mentioned the word sample there, I, I think in our response around phase two, I think we did have the foresight to say you probably don't want to have 180 of them looked at unless you absolutely want 180 of them looked at. I believe what we said was we would take certain risk factors and other criteria that we identified through looking at the first 18 to do a risk assessment of the 180 contracts that are in that population of over $1 million mm -hmm. from 2012 through 2017 and make a recommendation to you. Here are the ones if you chose to go into phase two that based on what we learned from phase one, we would recommend that you looked at because we wanted to be um, helpful stewards uh, in that regard and not just go in and look at necessarily 180 unless the risk factors were that all 180 need to be looked at. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had an additional question. Mr. Regan, uh, earlier there was a discussion about evidence uh, that shows procedures are undergoing a comprehensive update, and you responded that uh, UHY was provided documentation showing that a committee is updating such procedures. The documentation included a table showing all the procedures being considered for update, which we consider to be a comprehensive list, we being UHY. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, table and list in the appendix or in the report somewhere? That's in my work papers as support for that comment that I made in the report. Okay. Is that a document that can be made avail available to the board, or does management have it, and so we can discuss it with it's, management? It's not my document, it's management's document, so okay. I'm assuming it's available to the board. Okay, it's a management's document. Okay, that's helpful. Um, There was a reference to the previous legislative audit being reviewed. Um, and your response was, oh, the question was, were those findings still issues at BCPS? If so, what are they? And your response was, we obtained the previous legislative audit report and considered it in our planning our procedures, specifically looking up upon and reporting on the findings in that audit were not included in the scope of work and have not been performed. Correct. Okay, is that information in the final report somewhere? Uh, no, it was in our, again, on our planning work papers, but I believe the legislative audit reports public documents available at their website. Okay, thank you. Um, and that, that legislative audit, the 2015 one, if I understand, is gonna be attached so that we have all of that information together. Are there any other questions? 
Once again, I would like to thank you, Mr. Regan, for all the work that you've done and for uh, helping to facilitate the work of the board and the work of the school system in terms of identifying areas where we can improve. And we look forward to doing that together as a board with Interim Superintendent White and staff. Um, and that concludes this item. Thank you very much. Good evening. That brings us to item O, new business, fiscal year 2019 budget appropriation transfer. For that, I will ask Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris to come forward to present their fiscal year 2019 budget appropriation transfer. Good evening, Good evening. Uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and Superintendent. Uh, we're here uh, with the annual budget appropriation transfer. Uh, Mr. Tantliff's gonna provide a brief introduction and then we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> In front of you, you'll find a budget appropriation transfer. We often call it a BAT at BCPS request. Um, the BCPS budget consists of 13 separate appropriations by activities established by MSDE. Based on close monitoring of expenditures throughout the first three quarters of FY19, our current full year expenditure projection shows an overall surplus of $23.8 million, but with shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others. BCPS carries no contingency budget and to manage unanticipated expenses and revenues during the year, BCPS and county government both use the budget appropriation transfer process to amend the budget as necessary. According to the county charter, the BAT occurs in the final quarter of each fiscal year. Transfer of funds uh, between activities requires approval from the Board of Ed and the City Council. In addition, the BAT includes recommendations to use the projected surplus to meet urgent needs or complete important projects. This year, the BAT also includes some adjustments to align the data system uploads that converted BCPS account codes to the county government budget system. Following board approval, the BAT will be forwarded to the county executive and in turn the county council for consideration. Final county council approval occurs at the June council meeting. We'll now take any questions you may have. Ms. Mack? <laughs> County, not city, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I have questions on each section. So um, my first questions are on 03, instructional salaries. What is the average um, funding for an instructional salary? Um, uh, what figure do you use? Well, it, 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 it's all over the board because we have a wide salary structure. Uh, I would imagine the average teacher salary is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $65,000, I'd assume. But I'd have to get the exact figure. That's, that's very close to being correct, yeah. And how many open instructional positions do we have today? Um, give me one second. Sorry, I just misplaced my sheet right now. Right now we have uh, 167 vacancies in activity three. And how, what is the number of instructional positions that this 5.6 million will fund? Um, the $5.6 million is balancing out the activity. We, don't, we are not funding additional positions with it. So due to our normal course of spending, we underspend in some categories and overspend. 
Um, what happened, and I mentioned it in my opening this year that was a little out of the ordinary, is the way the county uploaded the budget into the system caused some variances versus what it was supposed to be because our instructional salaries are always under budget. This year, we're slightly over budget because of that error that the county um, had when they loaded the budget. But in the end, uh, through this process, we balance out all the activities to be in compliance with um, what we're supposed to be doing. But what, if we have 167 vacancies, would we not be carrying an overage anyway? You mean in underspend? If we have a vacan vacancies, we'd Say cause an underspend. Say within the budget. Would you not have money sitting in the budget for the 167 vacancies we have? Correct. Yes. That's part of the surplus that we're ending, the, in total, that we're ending the, ca the fiscal year with, primarily salary uh, vacancies. So you're saying that this money will not, will not result in any additional resources going to the schoolhouse. Is that a correct statement? That's correct. From a, uh, every vacancy, HR tries to fill as fast as they can. This is strictly an administrative um, something we're required to do because with a budget our size, the final budget by activity won't ever match what we planned initially during the year. We um, can't go over our, our overall appropriation, but it's in the normal course of things, we always have pluses and minuses in activities. Uh, a, significant, a significant amount's often driven by the principals. They're free to budget the funds we give them as they wish, and that causes several million dollars to typically move between categories. But because instructional salaries are such a large bucket, um, and because even a small vacancy rate causes um, a fair amount of uh, underspending, uh, you know, we are always come in overall under budget. And as I mentioned, right now we're, we should come in about $24 million overall under budget for the year. Okay, and then in category four, um, is this specifically limited to textbooks and supplies or will this be funding any um, ed tech software? Um, Software is typical. Not software, but like iReady, Dreambox, those things. Or is this just textbooks? Uh, it's textbooks and other supplies. That there, there's a number of different things in that category. Um, but activity five is where we normally um, would put the items that you just mentioned. Well, most of that. That was the, actually my next curriculum. question. So thank you. Is that all that would be in Activity 5? No, there, there's a lot of uh, different items in Activity 5. Most contract services would be there. Um, let me just indicate that we're, where you see in Activities 3, 4, and 5 reference to school budgets, this, is, this does not increase or decrease the total school budgets that are uh, managed by principals. Is that the per pupil allocation? Correct. So to relieve the bureaucratic burden on principals and allow them to utilize, to just focus on the bottom line and spend every penny that they have on students, we have eliminated a, a, a historic practice long ago whereby they had to transfer money between all of their line items in their budgets. We let them just spend, and at the end of the year, we come in and we balance these three accounts for them in this one large-scale compiled budget entry, so to speak. So the money that you see here for school budgets is just uh, money that they have spent differently than they originally planned, and we're going to balance it for them at the end of the year. Does this have anything to do with the per pupil um, increase of from $81 to $83 that's in the operating budget? Or is this separate from that? Uh, the, I think you're thinking of the FY20 increase. I'm sorry, yes, proposed. This Thank is you. FY19. Okay, so this is specific to 19. But these dollars, the school budgets are all derived from that per pupil yes. amount, regardless of whether it's this year's number, next year's number. All of these 
their, that's what where their budget is funded. And, and then how. my last question is in category six, how will the special special education five point, I have to put my glasses on, sorry. Four. 5.4, how will that be used? Um, currently in special ed, because of uh, the growth in number of students in non-public placement, we've gone over in special ed on non-public placement. So we're paying all the bills, the money's encumbered, because again, we have enough money in our budget in total, but we will overspend activity six, which is special education, primarily because of our current spend rate in non-public placement. So these these would not be dollars that would go into the schoolhouse either because it's non-public placement. Is that am I understanding that correctly? That's true. But again, this um, action does not actually change how anyone is spending their money. We're mirroring how they are planning to spend their money. But yes, that so this puts us in line with how we believe we will spend this year. So all the children in non-public placement based on how many serve how much services they're getting what we expect the final cost to be for the year this will true up activity 6 so that we have a positive balance at the end of the year thank you both um, mr mcmillian and then miss rowe gentlemen it appears to the viewing public that transportation has underspent 3,900,000 and there's a lot of bus drivers and attendants out there that are upset thinking that their management was, their leadership was told to restrain from spending that money. I received an email today that said that that $3,900,000, that's a not an accurate figure, and said that twenty-five dollars or $2,500,000 of that was a mistake when the county government entered it into their budget software, and I'm, I'm saying software, entered their budget someplace. That sounds like a really large mistake, $2,500,000, and then that leaves approximately, maybe it was $2,400,000, but it leaves about $1,500,000 still in that account. So these bus drivers are thinking, why can't that money be used for a variety of things in their department? Salary increases, training, recruiting, uh, bonuses, overtime, you know, why can't they use that money? And can you explain how that mistake happened? How can a $2,500,000 or $400,000 mistake happen when somebody's putting it in a budget when you're dealing with a system our size? Thank you. Well, let me, so Mr. McMillian, I think you had two parts of your question. So first let me answer how should the money be spent within transportation. Um, the board appropriates funds, the budget gets approved, management can't just decide to change compensation. Um, HR is trying as best they can to fill any vacancies that we have, um, but because it's, it is a difficult job, we find ourselves with more vacancies than we'd like, but we're actively, as best as we can, through all means we have, trying to fill those vacancies. Management does not have the ability uh, and all those, most of those things you mentioned are part of the collective bargaining process. Um, so that's the first, I think that hopefully addresses what you said there. Um, and the other piece is something we mentioned, there was an issue last year when the county uploaded our budget and several, um, there were several swings between activities and how they loaded the budget and they were unable to correct it before the budget got finalized. They knew that from day one going to the year, and they knew, <clears throat> they knew we'd have to correct that now. And again, through the BAT process, we can correct all of that. It doesn't cause any harm to how we spent our money this year. It um, will be fully corrected once the BAT gets approved. So I'd also like to add, um, first of all, we have hired every qualified driver we can find. We have hired every bus contractor we can find. Um, we have worked with AFSCME to provide every possible compensation and incentive to drivers. Uh, but as Mr. Tantliff said, we are limited by the collective bargaining agreements. And despite those efforts, at the end of, on June 30th, we think that, and 
while still pro allowing enough money to continue to hire contractors and drivers, that there will still be money left in Activity 9, primarily because of this uh, data entry error, but also about 1.5 million of which is just from vacancies. You know, we have about 65 driver vacancies. So what we're requesting in this transfer is that despite all these best efforts, there's money that will be in that account at the end of the year. We would like to use it for other educational purposes like instruction, uh, you know, special education textbooks. So the fact that we're projecting this balance does not mean that we haven't and will continue to actively spend everything we have uh, for, for, to improve transportation. Can I ask another question? Was that yes? Yes. Okay, sorry. Go ahead and continue this. And because the bus drivers know I have a CDL and I taught school for 35 years, it's amazing how many of them come to me with a wide range of complaints about the buses and that kind of thing. Uh, they continually talk about how dirty those buses are, that they can't use different sort of cleaning agencies in there because of possible allergies, you know, allergic reactions from the kids. I've seen mold in the buses. I've seen, I've seen it. Is there any chance that some of that $1.5 million that we could use to clean the buses, to whether we bring in a professional cleaning service or we use our custodians in some way or pay them over time, maybe even pay the bus drivers over time to clean their buses, somehow do that in a, in a safe kind of way? Thank you. There is, there is and there will be money in the transportation account for that service. Uh, I just... I'm not the operational manager of transportation, um, so we'll work with staff and address that question and uh, we'll make resources available appropriately. Sure. Ms. Rowe. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, since Mr. McMillian finished with transportation, I'll start there. Um, can we use some of the surplus transportation money for contract buses um, or for more special ed contract routes so that we can shorten special ed rides? Because we have buses and routes that there's a bus in my district where the parents are saying that bus hasn't picked up children since the 15th of December. So if we have surplus money, shouldn't we be using it on contract routes to fix some of these problems? I, I can't specifically answer your question, but I know from meetings earlier in the year with transportation, they are constantly looking at optimizing the routes and we're spending a lot of money on contract services. Mr. Smith. We have asked every single one of our contractors to give us every single contract you have available. I will hire them if they're there and they pass our certification. We have funds still in the budget, even after this transfer, to do so. So this is not taking any money from transportation. This is realigning the budget to, to address the pluses and minuses. So I think they addressed it before and I'll just say it again. We are not, we have not stopped hiring drivers permanent, substitute, temporary, or contractor routes. We're doing all of those upon availability. So ours is not that we're holding money not to hire them, mm -hmm. getting them certified to drive, and the contractors having them. They're having the same problem we're having in trying to hire them directly through BCPS. They can't find them either, and when they do, they can't keep them. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, we have a pretty robust economy. So our jobs in transportation are moving down the list of when people start selecting what to do. We don't want that to happen, but that's where we are. We're not going to stop our efforts in trying to hire drivers, even with this bat transfer. This is just moving the funds in the right category. We're going to still have dollars there to operate and to hire any available body that's there. 
Mr. Smith, thank you for joining us. While you're there, could you address Mr. McMillian's question about the bus cleaning? Because that, that is a concern that we have heard throughout the year, so I'm curious why something hasn't been done. I mean, there are cleaning services available, that, so that could be contracted out to a different uh, um, group of vendors or folks the issue is less about about contracting it out. We currently are under the watershed, the Chesapeake Bay watershed about washing large vehicles. The county has the same problem with large fire trucks. It doesn't mean that we don't want them clean. It's how you do it, in, as, it re, as it relates to retaining the runoff water, not going back into the watershed is the problem. So we'll do everything we can to work with the drivers and the lots to, to make sure that those buses are clean as best as possible. That, so uh, the funding that we have in order to address the buses and to get them clean, we'll, 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 we'll strengthen our efforts. But the issue that we need is a large facility to wash buses, and that's going to have to be a county project to do that so we can wash large apparatuses the correct way that is in alignment with the EPA and the state standard relating to runoff water related to that. Interior of the buses, we ask the drivers to PM, PM them every morning before they get on and when they get off, and we'll, we'll ramp up our efforts as it relates to the comments that were made here and what our drivers are telling us. So we'll certainly do that. Okay, because we have heard both about inside the bus in terms of uh, the bus drivers having excessive uh, uh, cleanliness issues that then they have to take extra time to clean up. And then also the outside of the buses, because our bus drivers have reported to us that the when the buses are dirty on the outside, the windows are dirty, that it's a safety factor in terms of visibility and that sort of thing. But I'm thinking, you know, $2.5 million would go a long way to build some sort of a facility where you can comply with the EPA, because certainly we want to comply with the EPA. But again, we need to be taking those major steps to to create solutions and a, and a good working environment for our bus drivers as much as possible to encourage them to, to stay with us. So we, we I, I would ask how much does it cost to build a, a, a proper bus cleaning facility? We, we, we make the request to the county as often as possible, but it's, once again, it's one of those items that gets approved or not. We'll certainly con continue to work with our local funding agencies to build more of those facilities so that we can address that. And, and that would end up as a capital project, so it's not part of our operating budget. Well, I'll get back to that point later. I, I I'll I still give it question. back to Ms. Rowe. Um, okay, so I would like to know, when we have schools that need more, better maintenance, I've read the state reports, and there's definitely we do grow good work, but there's always room for improvement. How are we not using the operation of plant money to maintain facilities? So if we have extra money in operation of plant. Are we not using that for facilities repair? We're doing uh, a number of uh, projects, for instance, that were not funded uh, by the county with our regular operating budget. Um, this year we're going to, you know, upgrade our security systems and card access controls. We're, it's a project that wasn't funded last year, so. So uh, how do we have a surplus in operation of plant? Because uh, of a million dollars worth of data entry error and a million dollars worth of savings in uh, utilities. Oh, the utility, okay. Or, or um, so, well, I understand what you're saying. And that's a, yeah. mm -hmm. So if we're under budget for instructional salaries, why are we moving more money into instructional salaries? We, we mainly have to correct the issue with the county. So that's why we have to move money into instructional salaries. Wasn't this an under amount? The 15 was an under? Yeah, yeah. They, they loaded 15 million too little into instructional salaries, so we need to put that back in, but a chunk of it was offset by, you know, our actual vacancies and underspending, our okay. positive variance. And so is, that, is that the same situation with other instructional costs, or did we spend over budget in other instructional costs? 
uh, 3.3 million was the county error. So most well, of this I think is county, the county error. County error was 2.2 million, isn't that right? And oh, yeah, right. the other Sorry, million was due to principals, what we talked about, yeah. spending their money differently. Okay, so it sounds like most of this is the county error. Is what's being done so that we don't have this error this year? Uh, I don't well, understand how the error happened to begin with, but well, it it was a process uh, issue that they had last year. But um, we've been working very closely with them, and they know they um, th they've taken steps to ensure it won't happen again. So, did you know this would happen, and we'd be doing this now? Or we did knew you just by the time out? once the county executive's budget was proposed the error had been made and couldn't be corrected. I see. So no, we, we didn't know about it till the, till the budget got presented. Last year? Last year, yes. Okay, so but you've right known after this whole year that you were gonna have to come to us today and make correct. adjustments in some right. capacity. And if yes. you look in the FY19 budget book, you'll see some weird negative numbers in there, which mm -hmm. is the only way that we could present it and still make sense out of it because of this error. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, I had questions. Um, so could you just briefly explain again the error by the county when it was realized and um, what document there is that relates to that? Um, we pass our budget as the board um, adopts to the county. Um, we have a process, and now actually this year we can load it directly into their budget system. Um, and that's one thing that is different this year that we're hoping will uh, minimize the potential for errors. We sent a staff person over there to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so once they made their changes, which in the end we're not privy to the changes they're making right before the county exec presented his budget, they're asking us questions. Um, but I think these changes were made very late when they entered them into their budget system. They ended up, the total was correct, but it ended up being in the wrong category. Then once the budget moved forward to the county council, they, we immediately, as soon as we got the, the um, budget details within a day of the county exec presenting, we identified the issue, but they were unable from a legal standpoint, or I don't know if that's the right word, but they, they were unable to make the change even though they understood it because the county exec had already presented the budget. I believe they would have had to redo the whole process with the county exec redoing the budget and they, they chose that didn't make any sense because it could be corrected administratively right here. The issue was that because some of these activities were uh, below where they needed to be and the and the county council can only make deductions to the budget, were, they didn't have the authority to add back to correct. Okay. Um, can you please explain the fund balance use over the last four years in terms of it increasing or uh, being depleted by our operational budget? Um, it's. Uh, in FY20, we're using a little less than FY19. FY19 was pretty flat to FY18. Um, our variance at year end, ha the last couple years, has been a little more than we've had to use in fund balance. So we've kind of, I would say, held at a steady state overall. Yeah, we we've, we've been budgeting around 30, and we've been returning at least that amount. Uh, if not more at the end of each year. So, and, and we're one of the few LEAs in the state whereby once the fiscal year closes, those funds revert to county government. So that entire fund balance uh, is, is managed jointly by us, but with the ultimate authority of county government. So as, uh 
things are progressing, where where are we targeted to end up with a fund balance for the end of this year? Well, I th um, I'll have to, I don't have the exact amount. Uh, I, I want to say head. that we plan to add about $33 million. Um, and of course, we're using about 31. So we've, we've been maintaining that rough equilibrium. So that it remains at 30 million? Or you're saying you're, we're using 31 and then we're? We're using 31 and then we're replacing it and then some by the end of the fiscal year. So what will our fund balance be on June 30th of this year? I'll, as projected? Um, well, I think it's going to be about $60 million. And on July 1, 31 of it is going to disappear, and there's going to be 32 left. OK. And it disappears because we use it as operating revenue. So. But it's going to be around the, the number I think you'll see in the financial statements is around 60 million. Right. So <clears throat> the other question I have is related to um, schoolhouse budgets. And our, uh, this is an issue that has been brought up to me. Are projector purchases in the schoolhouse budget or are they in the central office budget? I, uh, Department of Technology. Schools can use their own budgets if they choose, but the replacements uh, of existing equipment is done by the Department of Technology. Okay. And was there any thought to give additional, some of these additional funds to the schoolhouses in order for them to have additional spending through the end of the year? Um, the schools, that that has not been uh, something I don't believe it's ever been done. They have a budget. We try to make sure they spend their budget, and we, we a lot of times have to push to make sure they do get spent. One of the things we do, we have a, a, an incentive so that uh, secondary schools um, who have leftover substitute money, that money goes back into their operating budgets. and. It typically is around four hundred thousand dollars every spring. So four hundred thousand over twenty-four high schools. Yeah. Uh, or does that and include no, it's middle and schools secondary? Uh, so middle and high. So twenty-four high schools and twenty-seven middle schools have a four hundred thousand dollars. Every school, it's in. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. So we set a threshold, and if they've underspent, the superintendent will uh, approve for us to return some funds back to them. And okay. So it's. So it's 51 schools Might be potentially 30, 30 sharing to a pot 40. of 400,000. It's not 400,000 per school. Correct. 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 Okay. So that's a much yes. It's five ten thousand dollars typically. Okay. Um, my other question was also related to um, just to go back to transportation. Um, if we <clears> have <throat> not been able to spend on drivers and so forth, and we're hearing that we need to improve conditions for our bus drivers and, and any shortage of employees. There are um, efforts made to make it a more desirable place to stay, a more desirable um, occupation to be in. So I am very concerned that there hasn't been more focus on making those improvements for our transportation folks, whether it's just um, washing the inside of the bus to take off a burden from from our staff who, um, you know, are working very hard, many of them doing double runs and so forth in order to help the system deliver the children. So, I mean, I know Mr. Smith spoke to a renewed effort. This is, this is April and we still have an unknown number of children not getting to school on time. Mrs. Causey, I must say that, again, just as Mr. Smith said, we have made every effort to make sure that we're getting um, over there, we're hiring um, bus drivers again. Uh, we we can't, you know, we can't just create you know, bus drivers. We're making sure that we are recruiting, retaining, holding job fairs. There's one coming up, I believe. Um, we've made every effort to make sure that we are getting bus drivers again. Um, there are multiple things that are in play. 
it's not just about salary. Many times it's about sleep apnea tests and, and, and a, a person's um, BMI. There are criteria to be a bus driver. It's the number of people who have CDLs, and we're trying to make sure that we have prep programs for them. We have put every effort into this, and we will continue to put every effort into this. But to say otherwise, I think, is um, uh, unfair to the team that's making this effort every single day. Well, I think it's appropriate for us to voice the concerns that we hear and also to discuss options to improve the situation. We have a very important issue related to the safety of our students getting to school on time. We have a very important issue of losing instructional time. And it, it's just a mission critical issue. And maybe um, the board would, um, or me personally, feel better if we had a comprehensive report. And I know that you have mentioned you're building a dashboard, but I think um, I am going to be requesting that the board receive a comprehensive report for us to understand the on-time rate, the instructional loss. It's just an issue that's too important to continue very, to wait. It is very important. On understanding uh, how this is impacting our, our we students. We have given the board a report. We will continue to give a report, but until we get more drivers. Again, we need to make sure that we are able to recruit and retain more drivers so that we can do all of that. And again, this bat, when you talk about instruction, is about instruction. Keep in mind that during the FY20 operating budget uh, proposal process, this board cut $3 million from curriculum and instruction um, without discussion or without hesitation. This will help us to kind of restore some of those instructional costs. So again, this is about restoring instruction. If we really care about instruction, let's do the right thing and reappropriate this money to instruction. So there's a couple things, and Rod, I'll get right back to you, um, is that there was much discussion around the operating budget and the decisions that were made there. And there are hundreds of millions of dollars that are related to that. Uh, one of the other questions I had is, you know, we, we just had this two sheets of paper, um, and it says on it <coughs> uh, that there's related to proposed transfers and projected expenditures. And so I'm asking how much is projected spend versus already spent? What, what, what is that amount? For the entire system? I mean, what's In general, is every single dollar already spoken for on this chart? Uh, no, because salaries, our biggest bucket, is gets expended each payday. Now, uh, we've hit the deadline for purchase orders, so a lot of, uh, there's probably a few that'll dribble in, but people have gotten in their purchase orders, which encumber the money, even if, if it hasn't been spent yet. Um, people who are using P cards, those will still go through until June. They're making those expenditures. Um, but salary related expenditures are fairly proportional throughout the year, so we still have many millions of unspent salary dollars. Okay, and so one of the issues uh, that is that I'm thinking about is the fund balance, because we have uh, put forward an operating budget. Uh, that is unprecedented in the uh, amount that it is for maintenance over ef maintenance of effort, that it's over maintenance of effort by a percentage that's uh, unprecedented. We haven't received that amount. The last time we asked for 11 percent, over 11 percent, I believe we only got 4.9 percent. Does that sound about right? I think it was 5.9. 5 5.9. 5 maybe the most ever. Okay. So, um, so there's a large potential disparity, especially based on what we've heard from uh, the county government. So one of the options could be to align more of this money with the fund balance in order to help pay for some of those resources that we all voted for, that we all have been talking about, uh, in order to make sure that we have more money available for next year to fund those additional positions for schoolhouse resources, uh, the salaries for those schoolhouse resources. Um, so that's that's an option. I, I feel like we need to table this uh, to a future date to understand that more. So we really cannot do that. Um, this needs to go to the uh, county executive tomorrow to get onto their administrative calendar 
to be uh, reviewed by the county executive and then forwarded to the council staff to be reviewed at their work session uh, and then finally to get on their agenda for June 3rd. So uh, the charter requires that this be done in the fourth quarter. So as soon as the fourth quarter uh, commences, we, we put this uh, on your uh, legislative calendar so that uh, it can elapse over the next two months and progress through the counties process which is very exactly the same as this in order to be considered by the last meeting of of the legislative year at which it's adopted so i would implore you to uh not to disrupt that process if you want to make changes and if you don't want to spend money on textbooks and if you don't want to spend money on cases uh I would suggest those are things that, that the board could do. Uh, virtually everything else here is needed to balance the books. Um, so, uh, and if you don't want to replace projectors, I suppose we could do that, uh, that you could make that decision as well. Uh, that is, projectors are something that teachers and schools are demanding. Uh, computer cases, are things that we had to replace from last summer. Um, we do need to do the Chromebook pilot under the master agreement with Tavco because the board did adopt a budget uh, based on a shift to Chromebooks. And in order co to comply with the uh, master agreement, we need to put, uh, we're gonna put about 1,600 uh, of these units in uh, schools of various levels to comply, so there are some discretionary items here, and uh, I would just strongly urge the board to uh, make a decision tonight. Well, given we're just told that we have one day <laughs> leeway, it's really uh, would be more helpful to, especially with a board that has eight new members to have a little more time and a little more information um, involved than just four four lines on a table. Well, um, this is on the calendar every year. Every in year. In the exact same position. Every year position. is not this year. This year, we have eight new board members. This year, we have an operational budget that is above and beyond what we can expect and one of the things that we might have considered if we had more time is to try and increase that fund balance in order to say we really do want to be have some additional funds for next year for all of those resources that we're trying to get. Um, so that's a concern that I have. Are there other questions? Mr. McMillian? I actually think Mr. Kuhn was in front of me with his question. Okay. Uh, Gentlemen, I, I know that normally attendants are placed on special education buses. Uh, in an attempt to make the, the situation the best possible for a, a regular driver, have we thought about maybe doing a pilot program where we put attendants on the, the regular buses to try to help monitor that behavior in the back of the bus? That's part of the yeah, FY20 right. budget for That's high school. Uh, we added attendance for that specific purpose. That, Mr. McMillian, that was part of my proposal to, um, uh, to add 25 um, bus attendants to uh, typical routes where we see that we might have problematic behavior. Is there any chance we use some of that $1,500,000 for that this last quarter? Well, you, you know, remember, it's the middle of April now. It's spring break. There's really, I, I don't think any time to hire someone new together. and get Thank them you. on a bus w this close to the end of the school year. Mr. Kuhn? Excuse me? No, no questions. Okay, are there any other questions? Did we have a motion from anyone to approve the fiscal year 2019 budget appropriation transfer? 
Thank you, Mr. Offerman, for moving that. Is there a second? Second. Is there any additional discussion? I just have to say that it's very concerning to have the limited information and the deadline right in front of us. Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. The motion carries. Wait, what was the vote on that? Okay, the motion carries. The next agenda item is item Q, new business consideration of the 2019-2020 board meeting schedule. Pursuant to board policy 8311, each April, the Board of Education will adopt a schedule of its regular meetings for the succeeding school year. The exhibit includes the dates and times for Board of Education meetings, work sessions, and public hearings for the 2019-2020 school year. All meetings begin at 6.30 p.m. in the Greenwood campus here in Building E, Room 114. Is there a presentation by staff on this item? It says so in the... Nope. Okay. Um, so, board members, you had presented to you in board docs the regular monthly meetings. Do I have a motion to approve the 2019-2020 board meeting schedule? So moved. Second. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Any discussion? I would just like to point out there had been discussions about um, revising the board's process for developing uh, and uh, collaborating with the administration on developing the operating budget. So I did want to point out that there will be a possibility to amend these work sessions or public hearings based on the needs of the board. That is an issue that uh, is con being considered for the board retreat is uh, the ways that we can improve governance and one of those issues is the process for the operating budget so that there is flexibility in the future. Okay, can I have a, ra oh, let's see. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The vote is unanimous and the motion carries. The next item of business is item R, report on policies. First reading. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policies. Policy 1110, publications, radio, television, and digital meeting. Policy 1200, Community Involvement. Policy 5550, Disruptive Behavior, which is renamed as the Student Behavior Code. Policy 5560, Suspensions Assignments to Alternative Programs or Expulsions, renamed as Suspension, Expulsion, or Assignment to an Alternative Education Program. The committee has also approved the proposed deletion of policy 6602 alternative education programs because those contents are being placed in policy 5560. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit R. Staff is available should board members have any questions about these policies. They'll come forward to the board um, for second reader and that is the time that the public has to comment on the proposed changes. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The vote is unanimous and the motion carries. The 
The next item is item V, board member comments. And for that, I will start over with Mr. Offerman. And we will just go around the room. Uh, was, uh, I've been able to uh, visit uh, some more schools, including uh, a second visit to Parkville Middle, where I, where I was able to speak with staff uh, at, at some length. I uh, had a very good experience there. Uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, visiting uh, about three more schools before, uh, before, May, before the middle of May. Thank you. As spring has finally um, arrived, hopefully, <laughs> um, uh, the school year is um, moving along quickly, especially for uh, the seniors that we have that are heading quickly towards graduation. I would like um, just to uh, you know congratulate them on all their uh, all the work they've done throughout the years, um, and all the staff that has supported them, all the teachers, principals, everybody involved in in their education, uh, their parents, siblings, et cetera. Um, I would also um, ask them to keep their eye on the ball and finish strong. Um, I know that uh, we still have well over a month and a half of work left at the very least for uh, graduating seniors and uh, we go um, midway into june for everyone else so let's uh, finish strong and uh, and uh, finish out this year well thank you i'm so sorry that i missed the gt meeting the other night with the um, community soups I really intended to be there, but 8.30 came and I knew that it had already started and was probably close to being over. But I've heard some really wonderful things about what went on. But I knew Mr. McMillian would be there holding up the fort. Uh, I want to uh, again thank, as always, the staff for the wonderful job that you do for our children every single day and um, and I see in the back Mr. Baysmore who is our government liaison and I want to thank you I know you're happy that the session is over but thank you for going down on a regular basis and making sure that our voices um, from this board uh, were heard um, thank you uh, Mrs. Causey for um, um, precipitating the the letter and um, that was sent down, and uh, Miss Eileen Rosenberg, who is our our uh, administrative assistant for the um, government and legislative committee. But thank you, Mr. Baysmore, for everything that you did during this legislature. I'd like to thank the uh, interim superintendent and staff for continuing to do a, not a good but a great job. Uh, there are lots of things that come along in the course of a, a school year that will drive you bats. Uh, and actually, when I worked in a steel mill, I had a lot better word, but I'm not allowed to use it anymore. Uh, but You've handled all those well, as you always have. We depend on you, we thank you, and we look forward to your continued effort for the boys and girls of Baltimore County Schools. Thank you. So on Thursday, we will be hosting the student member elections, and I am very, 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 very excited. Like, I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to Omar and Matthew showing up and showing out. And second of all, I know everybody's probably want, been wondering, what's the frog for? So my fellow board members, they attended the National Board Association conference last weekend. This is called the Happy Frog. So the Happy Frog, the whole idea is that you can't have success if you're not happy. And they believe that I held down the fourth with being happy. So this board meeting, I have the Happy Frog. And I had the power of naming the Happy Frog. So of course, my Chadwick lovely leading ladies, they named the frog. It's a she, by the way, Frida, Frida the leader. So, 
This is Frida, and our next board meeting, I will be handing Frida off to another phenomenal board member. That is all. Thank you. So we had a terrific um, Building and Contracts Committee meeting earlier this afternoon. And again, I want to publicly thank Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit and your teams for your hard work in preparing for those committee meetings. Um, I've been on the committee since I joined the board in 2016, and I can say um, it's phenomenal, the difference that you've made and have brought to the process in preparing, and I know it's how hard you work and how hard your teams work to prepare for those meetings, and I truly appreciate it. I mentioned earlier you're all mind readers because I get, I get the exhibits and board docs, and you've answered 90% um, of my questions before I even come to the meeting. So um, for your efforts and towards leading us to be efficient in that process, we went through 13 contracts in about 26 minutes, if my records are correct today, which is terrific. So um, thank you all very much for your efforts. Please convey my appreciation on behalf of the committee to your teams. Um, I would say, though, that the highlight of the evening was hearing from our AVID students. Sorry, guys. The students will um, take center stage anytime. We definitely need more students to come out to our board meetings because they remind us why we're all here. So to students, I'm sure you're hopefully in bed by now, but um, if your teachers can tell you, please bring your students out. We, we love having you at board meetings, and it was the highlight of my day, if, if not week. So have a good night, everyone. Thanks. I just wanted to take a moment to say that uh, because we're not doing committee uh, updates, but I did want to, since I already gave a report earlier, to just say our policy review committee is coming up and it is going to be held on April 15th. And the committee's meetings are held in this room and begin at 430 and they are open to the public and our agendas are available on our website. And I'm just so grateful to um, John Offerman is my vice chair for his leadership in a lot of the work that's getting done, new agenda items that are being added. And I'm so grateful also to uh, our student member and to Ms. Um, Pasture. And um, I'm forgetting. Ms. Rowe, how could I forget you're on the Policy Review Committee meeting? In any case, we are working very uh, diligently to address issues for the school system, uh, to try and improve things for our students. And again, we appreciate the work of staff in that. And I do just want to take a moment and, and wrap up. And this board work is very complicated. And I really appreciate the intensity and the dedication and the diligence and that folks have because it means you care. It means we care. And while we may have a difference of opinions and feel that some things may take longer to get to a conclusion, I really want to make sure that every voice is heard and that we do deliberate those very important things. So I appreciate all of you tonight for what you've brought to this meeting, to the interim superintendent, to staff. I think it's very important for us to really do the work and sometimes it takes longer, but I think in the end it's worth it. So I would appreciate everybody and have a good night. And we actually love everybody very much, students and teachers, moving forward. No, good night from me. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to thank Ms. White and her staff that I've been working with on the lead uh, report. Uh, sorry, Mr. Dixit, we'll probably get to it next time. Um, on advice of our very wise student member, I would like to apologize for any unboardly or an ungodly behavior on my part. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, Mr. McMillian and I also had the opportunity to visit a Battle Monument School, and I would like to acknowledge, it, acknowledge Mr. Jerry Easterly, the school principal at Battle Monument, and all of his wonderful staff, his teachers, his aides. You guys do a wonderful job. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, the work that you do is what makes BCPS, BCPS strong, so keep at it. I also had the opportunity to attend the National Board um, NSBA conference with a few board members, and that was very enlightening as well. Last week, I attended the National Water Week at Capitol Hill, where we worked with legislators in Congress um, to, on different regulatory matters, including lead in school water. Um, so I look forward to talking about that at the next board meeting. So thank you all, and have a good night. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I've stimulated enough conversation tonight, so thank you.
Um, I would like to thank uh, Ms. White for inviting me to the tour of Lansdowne High School, and I'd also like to thank the principal, Mr. Miller, for not hiding anything. It was a very enlightening tour. Um, there was nothing that was off limits. He answered every question that I asked. Um, his new chief of staff, um, actually, I think chief of staff, actually went into the ladies' room when from the doorway we could see it was in pretty bad shape. I think the county executive wanted to go in, but he stopped himself. Um, I returned to Lansdowne for mock interviews and realized that I had been doing mock interviews there so long that my name tag had Verizon Communications on it. Um, it was very interesting, very enlightening, and very fun um, to see the breadth of students and what each one of them gets out of an assignment. And finally, um, as a community member, not a board member, I went to a screening of Screenager at Catonsville High School, and I highly recommend that everybody see that. I found it so enlightening, and the turnout was phenomenal. Uh, I, I understand the last time they did it, the turnout was very poor. I don't know what has changed, but the turnout at Catonsville High School was phenomenal, and I appreciated the opportunity to see that. Have a great evening, everybody. Great. Thank you. I just, again, would like to reiterate what was said as far as um, thanking Interim Superintendent White and her staff for all of the exceptional work that you do for um, how you support us, uh, provide us with information, and um, just really a, a top-notch job. Um, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Deer Park Middle Magnet along with um, Whitlawn Middle School, uh, attend their PTA meetings, and meet wonderful parents who are committed to their children's education education and talk about the partnership between working with teachers, working with administrators, working with parents, a real holistic approach to making sure that we are educating the, the whole child. Um, I was able to also see the exceptional principals at each of those schools and what they were doing and, and, and their commitment and um, I intend to go back but I just wanted to recognize them and the wonderful work that they're doing and the parents and the community and how everyone is working together to really um, work on behalf of our children. So thank you. So there, it's been a while since we've done board member comments and um, since then, I've visited Halstead Academy, Red House Run, and uh, Hawthorne Elementary School and Overly High School. And at Overly High School, while I was touring that school, I had the unique pleasure of walking into a classroom that was doing a mentorship group and listening to Dr. Penelope Martin Knox give her presentation to a bunch of um, girls on how to just be better people. And it was just a fantastic thing to see um, because I've never seen her talk to girls like that. I always just see her in here and it, they listen to her. And it's nice to see that we have role models in our school system who can mentor our young people in the development of their character and I almost didn't want to leave, but I had to go finish the tour. But I wanted to stay and listen to everything that she had to say. And so that, that was a great opportunity. And Red House Run sent me a, a painted rock a few days after the tour that says Red House Run on it that the kids painted, which is just fantastic. And I could go on about the wonderful things about these schools and the students, and they're happy, and they're so excited when you come to show off everything that they're doing that it's such a great um, uplifting thing to do is to visit the schools. Um, Ms. Causey, Ms. Jones, and Ms. Mack and I also attended the National Board of Education Association Conference. No, and, Scott, oh, Ms. Scott, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, attended the um, National Boards of Education um, Association Conference, and it was great to meet um, members of other boards and talk to them about different things that go on on their boards and what things that they do to help make their boards um, work for the school system and to learn about school governance. And we had uh, seminars on equity and cultural proficiency and of course, the happy frog. So thank you, and thank you all for staying so late. We had a very long agenda.
tonight. Thank you for those comments. We have item W, which is information. And as Ms. White pointed out, there's a new superintendent's rule 0200. So it's all on board docs. I really recommend people look through all of the items of information that we have, update on key school legislation, et cetera. And the final um, agenda item is announcements. The next board meeting is Tuesday, May 7th, 6.30 p.m. Right here, I really do thank you all. Take care. <laughs>